And of course, innovation is happening at a rapid clip inside China. And we no longer live in the era of planes and tanks and battleships. Technology today means artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and biosynthesis. None of those are areas in which we want to be even a fast follower. We want to be at the point of the spear on innovation on those things. I concur with the chairman on 702. The people sitting here today understand that 702 authorities must be reauthorized. 702, unlike the uh, Section 215 Metadata Collection Program, is a 24-7, day-by-day, essential tool to keeping this country safe. But the chairman's not wrong. Uh, the Congress, we have a long way to go to edu educating the Congress on precisely what those authorities are. Um, I would note that many of the abuses that the chairman made reference to uh, or misbehavior uh, occurred not under FISA 702, but under other FISA uh, authorities. And I note that just because we have a long way to go in educating the Congress of the United States and the people of the United States about exactly what it is that we're talking about. And you have a long way to go to validating my statement that this is a 24-7, day-by-day, essential tool to keeping the, America, the American people safe. So I look forward to our conversation, concur in the chairman's view that we are committed to pursuing the important work of this committee in a bipartisan, thoughtful, and constructive way, and welcome you again to testimony here today. Thank you, Congressman Himes. Uh, we now turn to uh, Avril Haines, Director of National Intelligence, who will be presenting the opening statement on behalf of the panel. Uh, welcome and thank you for your leadership, Director Haynes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman Turner, Ranking Member Himes, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today alongside my wonderful colleagues and on behalf of the extraordinary public servants we lead in the intelligence community to present the IC's annual threat assessment. And before I start, I just want to publicly thank the men and women of the intelligence community whose work we're presenting today from the collector to the analyst and everybody in between who made it possible for us to bring you the annual threat assessment in hopes that this work will help keep our country safe and prosperous, thank you. This year's assessment notes that during the coming year, the United States and its allies will face an international security environment that is dominated by two sets of strategic challenges that intersect with each other and existing trends to intensify their national security implications. First, great powers, rising regional powers, and an evolving array of non-state actors are vying for influence and impact in the international system, including over the standards and rules that will shape the global order for decades to come. In the next few years are critical as strategic competition with China and Russia intensifies, and in particular over how the world will evolve and whether the rise of authoritarianism can be checked and reversed. How well we stay ahead of and manage this competition will be fundamental to our success in navigating everything else. Second, challenges that transcend borders, including climate change, human and health security, and economic needs made worse by energy and food security, as well as Russia's unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine are converging as the planet emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic. And all at the same time, as great powers are challenging long-standing norms for transnational cooperation. Further compounding this dynamic is the impact that rapidly emerging technologies, Ranking Member Himes noted, are having on governance, business, society, and intelligence around the world. And given that background, the People's Republic of China, which is increasingly challenging the United States economically, technologically, politically, and militarily around the world, remains our unparalleled priority. Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, under President Xi Jinping, will continue efforts to achieve Xi's vision of making China the preeminent power in East Asia and a major power on the world stage. The CCP is increasingly convinced that it can only fulfill Xi's vision at the expense of US power and influence, and by using coordinated whole of government tools to demonstrate strength and compel neighbors to acquiesce to its preferences, including its land, sea, and air claims in the region and its assertions of sovereignty over Taiwan. Last October, President Xi secured his third five-year term as China's leader of the 20th Party Congress, and as we meet today, China's national legislature is in session, formally appointing Xi and confirming his choice to lead the PRC's state council, as well as its ministries and the leaders of the military, legislative, and judicial branches. And after more than a decade serving as China's top leader, Xi's control over key levers of power give him significant influence over most issues. 
She has surrounded himself with like-minded loyalists at the apex of the party's standing committee, China's highest decision-making body, and we assess that during the course of Xi's third term, they will together attempt to press Taiwan on unification, undercut U.S. influence, which they perceive as a threat, drive wedges between Washington and its allies and partners, and promote certain norms that favor China's authoritarian system. And you may have seen Xi's recent criticism during his speech on Monday of what he referred to as America's suppression of China, reflecting his longstanding distrust of US goals and his apparent belief that the United States seeks to contain China. Xi's speech was the most public and direct criticism that we have seen from him to date and probably reflects growing pessimism in Beijing about China's relationship with the United States, as well as Xi's growing worries about the trajectory of China's economic development and indigenous technology innovation, and challenges that he now blames on the United States. He also wants to message his populace and regional actors that the US bears responsibility for any coming increase in tensions. Despite public and directly critical rhetoric, however, we assess that Beijing still believes it benefits most by preventing a spiraling of tensions and by preserving stability in its relationship with the United States. Specifically, Beijing wants to preserve stability in East Asia, avoid triggering additional economic punishments from U.S. sanctions and U.S. partners, and showcase a steady relationship with the United States to avoid setbacks in its other relationships around the world, even while signaling opposition to claimed US provocations, including the shootdown of the PRC balloon. He wants a period of relative calm to give China the time and stability it needs to address domestic difficulties. Xi's principal focus is on domestic economic development, which is not assured. The IC assesses that China's long-term economic growth will continue to decelerate because China's era of rapid catch-up growth is ending, and structural issues such as debt, demographics, inequality, over-reliance on investment, and suppressed consumption remain. And although the CCP may find ways to overcome its structural challenges over the long term, in the short term, the CCP continues to take an increasingly aggressive approach to external affairs. Pursuing the goal of building a world-class military, expanding its nuclear arsenal, pursuing counterspace weapons capable of targeting US and allied satellites, forcing foreign companies and coercing foreign countries to allow the transfer of technology and intellectual property in order to boost its indigenous capabilities, continuing to increase global supply chain dependencies on China with the aim of using such dependencies to threaten and cut off foreign countries during a crisis, expanding its cyber pursuits and increasing the threat of aggressive cyber operations against the US homeland and foreign partners, and expanding influence operations, including through the export of digital repression technologies. The CCP will also seek to reshape global governance in line with his preferences and governance standards that support its monopoly of power within China. Beijing is elevating PRC candidates and policies at the UN, attempting to gain buy-in for Xi's development and global initiatives, promote blocs like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as a counterweight to the West, and shape multilateral groupings such as the formerly 17 plus one forum in Eastern Europe, but with mixed success. And in brief, the CCP represents both the leading and most consequential threat to US national security and leadership globally, and its intelligence specific ambitions and capability make it our most serious and consequential intelligence rival. During the past year, the threat has been additionally complicated by a deepening collaboration with Russia, which also remains an area of intense focus for the intelligence community. And when we were here last before the committee for the ATA annual threat assessment last year, it was only a few weeks after Russia's unprovoked and illegal invasion of Ukraine. Now we're over a year into the war, which is reshaping not only Russia's global relationships and strategic standing, but also our own strengthening our alliances and partnerships in ways that President Putin almost certainly did not anticipate, often precipitating the very events that he hoped to avoid, such as Sweden and Finland's petition to join NATO. And on the battlefield, there is currently a grinding attritional war in which neither side has definitive military advantage, and the day-to-day -day fighting is over hundreds of meters currently focused in Donetsk as Russia tries to capture the remainder of the oblast. The Russians are making incremental progress on Bakhmut, which is not a particularly strategic objective, but the otherwise, 
but are otherwise facing considerable constraints, including personnel and ammunition shortages, dysfunction within the military's leadership, exhaustion, and morale challenges. And even as the Russian offensive continues, they are experiencing high casualty rates. Putin is likely better understanding the limits of what his military is capable of achieving and appears to be focused on more modest military objectives for now. Export controls and sanctions are hampering Russia's war effort, particularly by restricting access to foreign components necessary to produce weapon systems. And if Russia does not initiate a mobilization, a mandatory one, and identify substantial third-party ammunition supplies, it will be increasingly challenging for them to sustain even the current level of offensive operations in the coming months, and consequently, they may fully shift to holding and defending the territories they occupy. In short, we do not foresee the Russian military recovering enough this year to make major territorial gains, but Putin most likely calculates that time is on his side, and prolonging the war, including with potential pauses in the fighting, may be his best remaining pathway to eventually securing Russia's strategic interests in Ukraine, even if it takes several years. Ukraine, of course, also faces challenges. Ukraine's prospects for success in a major spring offensive will probably hinge on several factors. At present, the Ukrainian armed forces remain locked in a struggle to defend against Russian offenses across eastern Ukraine. And while these Russian assaults are costly for Russia, the extent to which Ukrainian forces are having to draw down their reserves and equipment, as well as suffer further casualties, will all likely factor into Ukraine's ability to go on the offensive later this spring. The IC continues to monitor Putin's reactions and his nuclear saber rattling. Our analysts assess that his current posturing is intended to deter the West from providing additional support to Ukraine as he weighs a further escalation of the conflict. And he probably still remains confident that Russia can eventually militarily defeat Ukraine and wants to prevent Western support from tipping the balance and forcing a conflict with NATO. And of course, the already considerable human toll of the conflict is only increasing. In addition to the many tens of thousands of casualties suffered by the Russians and Ukrainian militaries, more than eight million people have been forced to flee Ukraine since Russia invaded. There is widespread reporting of atrocities committed by Russian forces, including deliberate strikes against non-military targets, such as Ukraine's civilian population and civilian infrastructure, particularly its energy facilities and electrical grid. Russia and its proxy groups almost certainly are using so-called filtration operations to detain and forcibly deport tens of thousands of Ukrainian civilians to Russia. And the IC is engaged with other parts of the US government to document and hold Russia and Russian actors accountable for their actions. The reaction to the invasion from countries around the world has been resolute, hurting Russia's reputation in the world and generating criticism at home. Moscow has suffered losses that will require years of rebuilding and leave it less capable of posing a conventional military threat to Europe and operating assertively in Eurasia and on the global stage. And as a result, Russia will become even more reliant on asymmetric options such as nuclear, cyber, and space capabilities and on China. Our assessment also covers Iran, which continues to pursue its longstanding ambitions for regional leadership and is a threat to US persons directly and via proxy attacks. Iran also remains a threat to Israel, both directly and indirectly through its support of Lebanese Hezbollah and other proxies. And most concerning, Iran has accelerated the expansion of its nuclear program, stating that it is no longer constrained by any JCPOA limits and has undertaken research and development activities that would bring it closer to producing the fissile material for completing a nuclear device following a decision to do so. North Korea similarly remains a proliferation concern as it continues its efforts to steadily expand and enhance its nuclear and conventional capabilities, targeting the United States and our allies, periodically using aggressive and potentially destabilizing actions to reshape the regional stability environment in its favor and to reinforce its status as a de facto nuclear power. In addition, regional challenges such as interstate conflicts, instability, and poor governance developments also pose growing challenges in Africa and the developing world. Increased poverty, hindered economic growth, and widespread inequality are creating the conditions that are feeding domestic unrest, insurgencies, democratic backsliding, authoritarianism, and cross-border conflict spillover. And several parts of the Middle East will remain plagued by war, insurgencies, and corruption. In the Western Hemisphere, persisting economic weakness, insecurity, corruption, are fueling public frustration and anti-status quo pressures that very likely will present governance challenges to leaders while also posing sustained spillover, migration, criminal, and economic challenges 
for the United States. Throughout the world, countries are struggling to maintain democratic systems and prevent the rise of authoritarians, in some cases because Russia and China are helping autocrats take or hold power. And as I noted at the outset, transnational challenges interact with more traditional threats and often reinforce each other, creating compounding and cascading risks to US national security. For example, climate change remains an urgent threat that will increasingly exacerbate risks to US national security as the physical impacts increase and geopolitical tensions mount over the global response to the challenge. And now entering the fourth year, the COVID-19 pandemic remains one of the most significant threats, excuse me, um, to global public health at a cost of more than 6.5 million trillions of dollars in lost economic output to date. In addition to direct effects of the pandemic, resultant economic, human security, political, and national security implications of COVID-19 continue to strain recovery efforts presenting both known and unforeseen challenges that probably will ripple through society and the global economy during the next year and for years to come. Russia's aggression against Ukraine has aggravated COVID-19-related fragilities in the global economy, raised commodity prices, fueled market volatility, and contributed to food insecurity and financial instability. And the combination of elevated energy and food prices has increased the number of individuals facing extreme poverty and food insecurity. Affected countries will struggle to reverse these trends through 2023, even if global food prices stabilize, and Russia's war in Ukraine can be blamed for these intensifying effects, something much of the world also understands and that others, including China, will have to come to terms with as they consider to what extent they want to continue assisting or enabling Russia. In climate change, the pandemic, and conflicts are exacerbating irregular migration, and in the Western Hemisphere, push and pull factors that drive migrants to the United States, such as deteriorating socioeconomic and security conditions, misperceptions of US policies, and employment opportunities in the United States will almost certainly persist through 2023. And please forgive me, because apparently the last two pages of my did not print out on this, so I'm just going to grab my extra copy. Transnational criminal organizations exploit migrants through extortion, kidnapping, and human trafficking, including sex trafficking and forced labor. And these organizations also continue to pose a direct threat through the production and trafficking of lethal illicit drugs, massive theft, financial and cyber crimes, money laundering, and eroding the rule of law in partner nations. In particular, the threat from illicit drugs is at historic levels with the robust supply of synthetic opioids from Mexican TCOs continuing to play a role in driving American overdose to over 100,000 annually. And terrorism, of course, remains a persistent threat, but the problem is evolving. Individuals and cells adhering to ideologies exposed, espoused by ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and transnational racially and ethnically motivated violent extremists movements in particular pose significant threats to US persons, facilities, and interests. And then two indirect threats that I think are worth highlighting. New technologies, particularly in the fields of artificial intelligence and biotechnology, are being developed and proliferating faster than companies and governments are able to shape norms governing their use, protect privacy challenges associated with them, and prevent dangerous outcomes that they can trigger. The convergence of emerging technologies is likely to create breakthroughs that are not as predictable and that risk a rapid development of more interconnected asymmetric threats to US interests. Relatedly, foreign states' malicious use of digital information and communication technologies will become more pervasive, automated, targeted, and complex during the next few years, threatening to distort publicly available information and probably outpacing efforts to protect digital freedoms and at the same time educate audiences on how to distinguish fact from propaganda. Authoritarian governments usually are the principal offenders of digital repression. And of course, democracies with open information environments are the most vulnerable. In closing, I wanna to bring to your attention the absolutely crucial authority that both Chairman Turner and Ranking Member Himes discussed will expire at the end of the year if Congress does not act, which is 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. I can tell you without hesitation that Section 702 was relied upon in gathering intelligence that was relevant to putting together this assessment, as it is hard to overestimate the importance of this authority to our work every day. 
FISA Section 702 provides unique intelligence on foreign intelligence targets at a speed and reliability that we cannot replicate in any other authority. Section 702 was originally enacted to enable the U.S. government to quickly collect on the communications of terrorists located abroad. And the authority allows the IC to acquire foreign intelligence from non-U.S. people located outside of the United States who are using U.S. electronic communication service providers. 702 is still vital to our counterterrorism mission. As evidenced by its key role in the U.S. government's operation against former Al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Sawahiri, but 702 is now principally relied upon for vital insights across a range of high priority threats, including China, malicious cyber act actors targeting US critical infrastructure, weapons proliferation, attempting to evade sanctions to deliver precursor chemicals to hostile actors, and even key intelligence related to threats emanating from Russia, North Korea, Iran, and I'll say China again. I realize that Section 702 is a powerful authority and it's incumbent on all of us in the intelligence community to ensure that the privacy and civil liberties interests of Americans are built into its design and implementation at every level. And over the last many years, we have significantly expanded oversight and dedicated resources to compliance in order to do just that. And we welcome the opportunity to work with you on reauthorizing this critical authority and building in your trust. Thank you for your patience and we we'll look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, Director Haynes, it was incredibly impressive to watch you to continue to read your statement while looking through your file. I don't know that any of us would have been able to do that, but Director Burns for the win. That, that, that was great. Um, As always. Yeah. Excellent. We'll now begin with member questions, and I yield my time to Representative Darren LaHood, the chair of our FISA 702 working mm -hmm. group. Darren. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Turner, and I want to thank the panel here today for your service to our country, and thank you for the work you do every day to keep our citizens safe and our country secure. I'm honored to be selected as the lead for this important working group on FISA reforms, and I'm excited to take on the necessary review. I concur with Chairman Turner that FISA, and specifically the authorities in Section 702, provide our intelligence community with an invaluable and irreplaceable tool that supports our national security apparatus in the fight against our foreign adversaries. As a former assistant U.S. attorney and specifically as a chief terrorism prosecutor overseeing the investigations and criminal prosecution, prosecutions of terrorist activities, I fully understand the value of FISA as an incredible collection asset in our fight against ongoing global and terrorist threats. This committee has been briefed countless times on the many successes directly attributable to our 702 collection authorities, some of which, uh, Director Haynes, you highlighted in your opening remarks. And I would also um, comment, uh, I know General Nakasone last month, or I guess in January, you spoke to the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board on the, the value of 702. In that speech, you talked about this authority provides the U.S. government with irreplaceable insights, whether we are reporting on cybersecurity threats, counterterrorism threats, or protecting U.S. and allied forces. FISA Section 702 has helped us understand the strategic intention of the foreign governments we are most interested in, including the PRC, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Unfortunately, uh, there are far too many members of Congress on both sides of the aisle that question whether the executive branch can be trusted with this powerful tool. And that's because of there in the past and currently there has been uh, abuses and misuses of 702 by the FBI. From where I sit today, I believe that a clean legislative reauthorization of 702 is a non-starter. To reiterate what the chairman said, you must first acknowledge that a problem exists before we can formulate meaningful reforms to build back trust and confidence in the FISA process. Director Ray, I wanna start with you and ask, are you willing to acknowledge that the FBI has committed abuses and violations in its use of FISA, and is that defensible? Well, first off, no violations are defensible, in my view. Uh, it's important to distinguish, uh, as I think both the ranking member and the chair may have, uh, between things that happened with Title I FISA, you know, for example, that were at issue in the Inspector General report related to the Crossfire Hurricane matter, which, as I've said before, describes conduct that I consider totally unacceptable, totally unacceptable and unrepresentative of the FBI, and we implemented all sorts of reforms that I could go into on that. Then over on the 702 side, 
there have been compliance incidents that have to be addressed, and we have taken all sorts of steps that I could walk the committee through here uh, to address that issue. And what's important to note about that is that all of the reports to date that have been shared with the public, and I think with the Congress, about 702 compliance issues all predate, that is the conduct at issue, predate all these reforms, which is why it's so important for me to be able to let the committee know, uh, and this will be coming in the uh, in more detail in the next ODNI report that comes out uh, in late April, I think it is, that we have now seen a 93% decrease year over year from 21 to 22 in the number of US person queries made by you know, the FBI. And that's not just an aberration of that one year. If you compare it to 2020, so the year before that, it's about an 85% increase. So it's a dramatic increase uh, in the uh, judiciousness with which our people are running uh, their queries. Uh, and we are absolutely committed to making sure that we show you, the rest of the members of Congress and the American people that we're worthy of these incredibly valuable authorities. Well, I appreciate you mentioned that. I would say uh, because of a number of these abuses and non-compliance issues with the FBI, would you agree that the FBI has a trust issue with the American public and specifically with members of Congress? Well, certainly uh, anytime we have anybody who, who has a, a trust issue with us, we wanna try to address it. Uh, I think when I see, look at the American people more broadly, uh, I think a lot of it is reaction to specific cases and things here and there, but I will tell you that I see the American people showing up in droves to come work at the FBI. That, putting that to the side, putting that to the side, we clearly have work to do and we're eager to do it with this committee to show that we can be worthy stewards of these important authorities. Uh, and so if there are questions that, are, that need to be answered, I understand completely why those questions are being raised. We brought them on ourselves. And I wanna make sure that we can show you that we can answer those questions. And, and how do you give reassurance to the American people that their civil liberties are gonna be protected? Well, the, the changes that I started describing at a high level uh, include all sorts of things. So that's everything from system changes that prevent even, even inadvertent compliance incidents. That's new safeguards, new approvals, new oversights, all sorts of mandatory enhanced training I created and stood up an entire new office of internal audit that did not exist at the FBI before and brought in a former agent who's also a former big four accounting firm partner to run that office of internal audit. And that office is focused exclusively on FISA compliance. Uh, ultimately, in the long run, we want that office to take on other kinds of compliance too. But because of the importance of this issue, because of the importance of the concerns that you and others have framed, we've dedicated that Office of Internal Audit to focus exclusively on this important authority and compliance with it. So those are some of the things. Obviously, there's a lot more that I could get into, but I'm sympathetic to the time constraints here. Well, thank you for that. Uh, unfortunately, I believe uh, that the FBI does have a significant trust issue with members of Congress, um, and that's part of what we'll deal with with the working group. And it's, I would say that trust has only been made worse by the recently declassified Section 702 compliance report covering December 2019 through May of 2020. Uh, in that report, there was a number of concerning things that were brought forward. There was queries done inappropriately by the FBI on a local political party. And then secondarily uh, included in there was one specific instance of abuse involving multiple queries of a sitting member of Congress in the FBI's FISA databases. Buried in a footnote of the declassified assessment, this specific incident described as follows. Quote, an intelligence analyst with the FBI conducted multiple queries using only the name of a US congressman. The 707 report describes the specific facts that led the analyst to conduct these queries these queries retrieved unminimized FISA acquired information, including Section 702 acquired products that were opened. FBI advised that no minimized FISA acquired information was disseminated or used in any way. This was reviewed obviously by the National Security Division of the US Department of Justice and ODNI, and based on what they reviewed, they found these queries to be wholly inappropriate, not compliant, and a violation because they were overly broad as constructed. Uh, I think that the report's characterization of this FBI analyst's action as a mere misunderstanding of querying procedures is indicative 
of the culture that the FBI has come to expect and even tolerate. It is also indicative of the FBI's continued failure to appreciate how the misuse of this authority is seen on Capitol Hill. And I want to make clear the FBI's inappropriate querying of a duly elected member of Congress is egregious um, and a violation not only that degrades the trust in FISA, but is viewed as a threat to the separation of powers. Um, I have had the opportunity to review the classified summary of this violation, and it is my opinion that the member of Congress that was wrongfully queried multiple times solely by his name was in fact me. Um, now, uh, this careless abuse of this critical tool by the FBI is unfortunate. Ironically, I think it gives me a good opportunity and a unique perspective on what's wrong with the FBI and the problems that the FBI has. Um, to highlight that, I would like to submit for the record a couple things. Uh, February 28th, 2023, Director Haynes and Attorney General Garland uh, asked for a reauthorization from the Congress, but they go in to add that there needs to be rigorous and ongoing oversight of the FBI 702 querying, specifically their collection decisions on U.S. person inquiries, and they will be evaluating and taking remedial action to address identified incidents of noncompliance by the FBI. I'd like to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Secondly, uh, a letter was sent to you on February 15th, uh, Director Ray, uh, 2023, from Congressman uh, Andy Biggs of Arizona. And he talks about uh, the declassified 2021 report detailing these continued abuses of 702. In there, he mentions that these instances should frighten every American and Congress deserves an explanation for them. He additionally talks about these, quote, backdoor searches are a violation of the Fourth Amendment and cannot continue. I'd ask to submit that for the record. Without objection. Thirdly, uh, article in Politico from March 1st titled DOJ Faces Bipartisan Falnicks or Army of Skeptics on FISA 702. In that article, again, referring to this declassified report on the inappropriate use of 702, it talks about, um, in a sign of, uh, I'll quote here, in a sign of odd political bedfellows in the House uh, who are pushing reforms, uh, conservative Congressman Andy Biggs and progressive member uh, Pramila Jalapai, both members of the Judiciary Committee, publicly vetted on the detail tucked in the footnote of the report. An FBI intelligence analyst improperly queried surveillance data on a U.S. member of the House. I'd ask to submit that for the record. Without objection. Lastly, the footnote that I mentioned uh, that has been declassified states in there that the National Security Division of the U.S. Department of Justice and ODNI assessed, based on the facts and analysis of this FBI analyst, that these queries were not compliant because they were overly broad as constructed. I'd like to submit that for the record. Without objection. The bottom line is 702 deserves to be reauthorized because it's an invaluable tool to our efforts to counter the threats of our adversaries. But the FISA Working Group must and will pursue reforms and safeguards through this reauthorization process. To help explain to the public why 702 should be reauthorized, I have a few questions for our other panelists. Director Haynes, why do we need 702 to specifically counter China? Thank you, Representative. I, specifically with respect to China, there are a number of ways in which 702 is crucial. It's crucial in the context of counterintelligence, where we are looking at where it is that uh, China's um, efforts to send spies into the United States maybe, and what their planning is in relation to it. It is crucial in the context of uh, threats to our, um, you know, to U.S. victims and to critical infrastructure through cyber, as we've all indicated. It's crucial to understanding a whole range of issues because it is effectively the most uh, sort of effective way for us to gather intelligence against non-U.S. persons outside of the United States. Thank you. And Director Burns, what does 702 mean for the CIA's ability to counter China? Um, it's crucially important for all the reasons um, uh, sir, that Director Haynes just mentioned. Um, it also uh, enables us to focus on efforts to evade sanctions, to steal intellectual property, 
to uh, obtain uh, sensitive technologies as well. And so in all those areas, it's extremely important. And Director Nakasone, can you quantify in some way how vital 702 is to the NSA's efforts to counter China? And I know you specifically referenced a, a number of incidents that uh, in your speech in January. I would quantify it, uh, Congressman, by saying it is the number one authority that we need. Uh, I can go into closed uh, session with regards to the specific areas where it is so important. Thank you. And uh, Director Barrier, as a consumer of the information obtained by 702, can you explain the value of this information in DNI's efforts to counter China? Yes, I can. As an all-source intelligence agency, while we don't do FISA collection, we certainly benefit from the insights we get from that. We bake that into our all-source analysis to illuminate <coughs> threats uh, for the Department of Defense and the nation. Thank you for that. Um, in closing, I'm honored uh, by Chairman Turner's selection as the chair of the FISA Working Group, and I'm energized to begin our bipartisan work with the Judiciary Committee and our Senate colleagues to reform and reauthorize this vital tool. I also look forward to working with all of you here before us today and request your cooperation in this endeavor. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Member Himes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you again to our witnesses. My um, Good friend from Illinois put a lot of, on the table there, uh, much of which, unfortunately, I was not briefed on. So, uh, Director Ray, I'd love to start just by giving you a minute or two to respond if you would like, but I'd like you to keep it to a minute or two if you would. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to say, so I'll be very brief. The, I completely understand uh, Congressman LaHood's concerns and everything he read. The main point I would make for today's purposes is that all of those problems, and they are problems, all of those compliance violations, and they are violations, predate predate all of these reforms that I was trying to summarize. And so my hope is that we will be able to show by working with the working group how these reforms will prevent stuff like what you described from happening again in the future. Uh, thank you, Director Ray. Um, I'm going to direct my next question to uh, uh, Director Haynes and Director Burns. We spend a lot of time thinking about the mechanics and tactics of what conflict would, with China would look like, and we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the economics of tension leading to ultimately conflict were that to occur. Um, th this is not current, but Rand did a study in which they estimated that Chinese GDP in the event of a, of a conflict would contract by a staggering 25 to 35%. US GDP could contract by five to 10% if there was conflict in the Taiwan Strait. So the perplexing thing here is, this is a country that it, really the sole reason that it has been able to achieve the economic growth that it has to the point where today it's uh, on an aggregate basis, the largest economy in the world has been engagement with the world, uh, licit engagement through trade uh, and, and other things and illicit engagement through the stealing of IP, the manipulation of currency rates over time, et cetera. So, so I wonder, two part question, can you paint a picture of uh, if we continue to, if, if tensions continue to be exacerbated leading to a point where there is conflict, what that would look like for the global economy, for the Chinese economy, and most importantly, help me understand why a Chinese leader would risk the golden goose, essentially. I'll start. I, so I think to your point, um, Representative, I, uh, it is not our assessment that China wants to go to war. And that is something I think to start with. In other words, they are, you know, we continue to assess that, for example, even with respect to Taiwan, that they would prefer to uh, achieve unification through peaceful means as opposed to through a use of force. They nevertheless are utterly committed to unification. And I think that is the challenge. In other words, she has made it quite clear that that is something that has to happen. And as a consequence, if they uh, believe that peaceful unification is not an option, then they are in the potential for actually trying to achieve it militarily, and they are certainly planning for that potential. And then in terms of, of the impact that it would have, I, I think, you know, um, obviously it depends on what the conflict looks like. But to your point again, I think it's absolutely right that this is, um, any conflict is likely to have enormous economic implications. And, uh, and one of the things that we have certainly looked at and that others, uh, you know, within the government, Treasury and Commerce and so on, have looked at is the, the implications with respect to Taiwan of a disruption of, 
you know, their materials, particularly their semiconductors. And we've, uh, you know, studies show that it would actually have an absolutely enormous implications for the global financial economy if there were disruption to Taiwan's semiconductor production. Because really, you know, um, Taiwan, the, the semiconductors, the chips that come out of Taiwan, are present in virtually every category of electronic devices around the world. Leave it at that. Director, I know I know CIA conducts uh, economic work and economic assessment, so I'd be interested in your view. Sure, and, and just in, I would just add two examples to what Director Haynes said in terms of the calculus of the Chinese leadership, both on Taiwan and in terms of its relationship with Russia. I think on Taiwan, well, as Director Haynes said, we don't see evidence today that, uh, that she has made a decision to uh, invade Taiwan. It's, I would never underestimate the ambitions of the current Chinese leadership in that regard or their determination. I do think that nobody has watched more intently Vladimir Putin's experience in Ukraine than Xi Jinping has. And I think he's been sobered to some extent, at least it's our analysis, by the extent to which the West was able to maintain solidarity and absorb some short-term economic costs in the interest of imposing even greater long-term economic costs on Russia. That's something that President Xi has to weigh as he comes out of zero COVID, tries to restore Chinese economic growth, tries to engage with you know, the rest of the global economy. And I think that also you know, weighs in his decision about whether or not to supply lethal equipment to Russia. We see clear evidence that the Chinese leadership is considering that, not that it's made a decision, not that it's begun lethal shipments. But there again, I think that economic factor, as Director Haynes said, has to weigh significantly in the calculus of the Chinese leadership. Do we believe that the Chinese leadership sufficiently appreciates, even, even were they to supply lethal weapons, that would have economic consequences. An awful lot of people around the world would be much more hesitant to do business with China. Do we believe that the leadership in Beijing understands how that is a first step towards, again, killing the golden goose that has allowed that country to grow economically? I think the only, the only thing that I would highlight, Congressman, is that I think it's been important that European leaders have spoken up on this issue as well, because I think for a long time the Chinese leadership has assumed that it could drive wedges between the United States and our European allies on an issue like this. I think the fact that several prominent European leaders have spoken out directly about this uh, is a very important step. Thank you. Um, second category of questions is on technology, and I want to be respectful of my colleagues' time, so I'm going to direct the questions to General Nakasone and, and General Barrier. Um, I had the opportunity last week to visit CIA and see the uh, work that's been doing, been done by the director in terms of technological innovation. Uh, uh, director Burns has made it a strategic priority. Um, he hired somebody from the outside to be chief technology officer. Uh, the visit was amazing. This new chief technology officer <laughs> cleared out offices, created an open floor space. There's free snacks. It's, they're just you know, missing a millennial playing the guitar to, to, to reproduce what you see in Palo Alto every day in the middle of CIA headquarters. So um, with that as, as context, um, what are you guys doing? Uh, I'll start with you, General Nax. What are you guys doing that is as tangible as what CIA has done to make sure that we are at the cutting edge of, it, of, of technological innovation. One of the things we've done, uh, ranking member, is look at different partners. Uh, this is the key piece of what we've learned from Russia, Ukraine. Uh, the private sector has been incredibly helpful in terms of where we need to go in being able to thwart what Russia has attempted to do in Ukraine. We've opened up a cyberspace collaboration center, an unclassified um, building where our analysts go to engage with the private sector and members of the defense industrial base to do two things. One is to provide information in the defense industrial base in terms of what is going on in the domain of cyberspace. Two, is to also get information from what we're seeing out there. What are the new leads? What are the things that we have to be able to, to emphasize? Uh, the coming decade is certainly a, a decade where cyberspace will be dominant. One of the things that we believe is that we have to have those partnerships that are so critical. General Barry. Congressman, our, our innovation engine is really fueled by this thing called Nidapedia. This is where Nidapedia, where, where companies can come in with great ideas on, on how they might be able to help the defense intelligence enterprise. We evaluate those ideas, we meet with those folks, and then, and then we try to pull their ideas in. Our two major focus areas right now are AI and ML for our program called MARS, the Machine Assisted Analytic Rapid Repository System, which will revolutionize the way we do foundational military intelligence, really pulling in swaths of data to make uh, that environment much richer for our analysts. And the other piece is really our, our MAZIN sensor modernization to be able to take all of those 
varieties of signals that are out there that are new and unique and be able to pull them into our Mazin enterprise. That's the focus of DI. Thank you. Uh, General Barry, I, I appreciate that, and, and, and I'm glad you highlighted uh, openness to outside companies that are not the traditional primes. I think that only gets you about a third of the way there because I've just heard too many stories of innovative companies who just have no hope of navigating the acquisition process and authorities and everything else, even though they may have cutting edge technology far better than what would be. So I'm gonna follow up with you uh, on that and uh, yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Winstrup. Well, thank you, Chairman Turner, Ranking Member Hines, and all of you for being here today. Director Haynes, uh, you, you cut right to it today about the challenges that we face as, as a nation, the threats that we have. Threats to our country are not new, but some of the forms of those threats uh, are new. And, and I want to talk about that a little bit. The Chinese Communist Party is very desert, uh, assertive. They want to destabilize us as much as they can and they're, they're getting pretty good at it. So the growing concerns I have are the development of adversaries, uh, biological weapons is of great concern to me, and also the flow of illicit fentanyl coming into our country, which even in a meeting with the Chinese ambassador, he admitted we sell the precursors, those are legal products, you know, it's somebody else's problem after that. Well, it is our problem, and I do wanna hold those accountable for these uh, efforts to be held accountable at, at, at some point, and we've got to do a better job of that. And I think we need to address and invest in so the resources we need to to stop the scourge of this uh, of fentanyl, illicit fentanyl, and also the creation of bioweapons is something we should be greatly concerned about, as with any weapon an adversary may carry. Uh, so it's our responsibility, I think, uh, to really work together on these, these things as best we can. We had a panel a few weeks ago, Dr. Heather Wilson was there, and I asked how we could work together uh, a little bit better in her, in her eyes. And she mentioned how the law requires members of this committee to be kept fully and currently informed of the intelligence activities of the United States. That's this committee. It's not every member of Congress. It's not the general public, and we all get that. But for this committee, uh, it, it has to happen, and we need to insist upon that. And we also need to insist on our side uh, that we engender trust to the seriousness of this committee and the work that we have to do and our own professional responsibilities in this relationship. And, and I think we're at that point. I really do with, with this committee right now. But we have the responsibility of oversight as well as working with uh, all of you and in my mind, there can be no walls between us. There can be walls around us at times. There needs to be walls around us at times. But there should be no walls between, between us if we're going to be effective. And we really can only move at the speed of trust. And I feel like I've uh, developed relationships with, with all of you. Uh, it's been very helpful to the work that we do on this committee. And I thank you for that. Uh, sometimes we can do a little bit more. And so, uh, Director Haynes, I know this committee has written you a, a few times about who the intelligence community consulted with regarding the assessment of COVID-19 and its origins. Now, I chair the select subcommittee on the pandemic, all things with the pandemic, and origins of COVID is, is important. And even yesterday in our hearing, every, every person on the committee bipartisan, and every one of our panelists said, finding the origins of COVID is an important project we need to continue and try to get to. And we can go into all those reasons. Um, you know, why is, it why is it important though that it, for us to have this information and to know who the experts are? And uh, you know, if we hear something like, it's our policy not to tell you on the committee who we spoke to, that's a problem. And it is important who you spoke to, because if who someone spoke to may have some personal bias uh, or other agenda or political bias towards their conclusions. I mean, look, you see, you've seen all these agencies with different conclusions. Well, why is that? Well, part of that may be depending upon who they talk to. So that is important that we get that information. And it, it's, it's my understanding that the DOE would be willing to show us their underlying report, especially their updated report. But uh, since OD and I owns the assessment, you'd have to approve that. So what I'm gonna ask is that you would approve that and, and get us that information so that we can move forward. 
And uh, I would hope that we can also get the information of actually who they talk to. This, it's important to this committee. It's important to the country. Uh, so um, I guess I'm just asking, would you commit to that at this time? Thank you so much, Congressman. I, I know this is an issue that we've talked about before. Right. And I think, first of all, on the DOE assessment, absolutely, I, I suspect it would have to be in classified form. I'm sure it's sure. a classified report. but. It, it, more than happy to share any uh, final assessment that they've done if they're comfortable with it. I can't imagine myself standing in the way, so I don't know what that is, but we'll, we'll look into that and get back to you quickly. I think on the more general issue, let me just put a few things down. I think one problem for us is that we obviously want to be able to consult with outside expertise, including academics, variety of other experts in you know fields, uh, related to uh, COVID-19, but also a series of other areas that we work in. And often for uh, many academics that we consult with, it's not something they want to, they do not want to be known as consulting with the intelligence community. It creates challenges for them. If, and if I may, I'm, talk, I'm but, talking about in a classified setting. No, 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 I'm, and, so and, let and, me and, 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 and this I'll is just, important, and this is important to the work um, because we do need to know who they are and w how they came to their assessments. Congressman, let me just finish. I'll, okay. I'll explain. So, sure. so often what will happen is they will, for example, be willing to participate in a conference or something along those lines that's not for us, and they will do it under Chatham House rules that says that we can't attribute, essentially, anything to them specifically, even though we can bring the information out. That's an example of the kind of challenge that we end up in. So we can't, what we have been able and willing to provide in classified or in unclassified, and we've given this obviously, is the basically the backgrounds of various experts that we've consulted with, the actually published information that we've relied on, Director, and answer I'm, any questions Director. about how we got to a conference. Director, I'm gonna need and you to conclude. Got it, and I'll just finish with the last thing, which is that if there's anybody, sir, that you want us to talk to that you feel like we haven't, I commit to you that we will absolutely take those names and we will ensure that we are consulting with them as well. We're just trying to do the best job we can to, in the future, be able to pre pre predict a pandemic, prepare for it, to protect the American lives, and to prevent one if we can. Mr. Carson. Thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member. This is an open question. Um, last week, our committee heard from several uh, respected leaders from the think tank community, and in their remarks, they presented uh, differing views about whether a standalone open source agency is needed in the IC, what are your views and what is what are your agencies doing to incorporate open source reporting in its analysis to help counter the threats described in your remarks? I'll just start, but I think going to Director Burns and to General Barrier would be useful for you to hear what they're doing because they are really centers of excellence in uh, this area. We have um, been through a process whereby we've been trying to ensure that the open source work that is being done across the community essentially is as effective as possible in supporting the priorities across the intelligence community. And, uh, and one of those issues that's come up is how do we organize ourselves? How do we ensure we have the right talent? How do we ensure we're supporting the technology that's needed and, um, and ma maintaining the partnerships uh, with the private sector and otherwise that are important to this effort? And uh, we had an external panel look at that and we have um, received advice and we are going to be establishing at ODNI and I and, um, OSINT executive, which is a small group, it'll be like a dozen folks if we go forward with this, basically to support the work that is being done across the intelligence community. The CIA is the functional manager for us on OSINT, um, and uh, the uh, DIA is the uh, defense intelligence enterprise manager on this. Um, so I'll turn to them. Sure, no, just to add, Congressman, I mean, um, I take very seriously the increasingly important role of open source information. We can't function effectively as an intelligence service, as the functional manager across the intelligence community, unless we put more resources, more drive, more energy into this issue. So I appointed a new director of our open source enterprise several months ago, and I'm really pleased with the drive and energy and creativity that he's bringing to this as well, not only to make better use of artificial intelligence and machine learning, because the challenge for us, for our analysts, is sifting through 
you know, the, you know, the avalanche of information that's out there, sifting through the haystack to get to those needles that are gonna matter most to human analysts, human analysts and doing it very quickly. And then to work with Director Haynes and General Barrier and our other partners in the IC to avoid duplication. So we're, we're, you know, we're learning from one another's experiences. Um, and then also, I think, to look at ways in which we can learn from one another on training, on governance issues as well. So I'm pleased with the progress we're making, but I'm determined to continue to drive this. Congressman, we, we think that open source, when combined with other um, sources of information that are classified, really comprises the secret sauce for all source analysis. And so I would say, from a defense portfolio side of the house, what we are trying to do is um, formally establish the defense program so that we, we have standards for training, tradecraft, that we're not getting ripped off in multiple places by, by buying the same, the same kind of data, and that we're doing this in a way that's smart um, across the services and across the, the combatant commands. Lastly, um, Chairman, uh, recently we heard from several speakers, including General Petraeus, uh, who warned of a lack of a genuine uh, workforce development training in the IC. Uh, what are your organizations doing to improve diversity when it comes to recruiting and retaining your workforces? And if you agree that the IC needs to, to devote more resources to professional development, how do you all plan on tackling uh, those very apparent issues? Yeah, thank you very much, Congressman. I, I think there is no question that we have to do better on diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and accessibility. And I think um, you'll see in our uh, budget requests and our proposals in all of the work that we're doing that we are um, uh, that we see this as an area that we need to focus more intense resources and efforts. I will tell you that um, what you you know is a general matter when I look across. ODNI, for example, um, in the senior leadership, uh, you know, and I look at the percentage of um, Hispanic and Latinos, for example, it is, you know, a little bit more than 3%, and that clearly does not reflect the country. These are things that we are trying to get out. So the first part, from my perspective, is ensuring that we have data that is reliable, that allows us to be held accountable to what our um, diversity and inclusion is, and uh, that we're able to do barrier studies and work that allow us to understand where there are challenges. We are also working across a range of other issues um, that we've seen to sort of promote recruitment across the country in a variety of different communities to ensure that we're reaching uh, folks that don't normally come to the IC or know about the IC, that we are focused on retaining the diverse talent that we do have. Um, we've recently looked at a project that Director, would help I'm, to- I'm gonna have to ask you to sorry, summarize. To in order to get through the list that we have, um, and Bruce, we're gonna have to close the list, we're gonna have to start keeping to the, to the everyone to the five minutes. So if you'd make your answers just a little bit shorter so we can get to everybody and get to the closed session. Okay, all right. Yield. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, Mr. Stewart. All right, I'm gonna talk really fast. <laughs> there, there's a couple things I do wanna talk about, uh, and, I'm, and again, to hit them both, I'm gonna be very brief on the first one, and that is 702, to reemphasize the importance of that. Thanks for all of you being here. We recognize that each of you are distinguished leaders. Uh, if I could make this point in introduction to 702, all of us are responsible to the people, but those of us sitting up here have a special responsibility to the people. We go home every weekend and we talk with hundreds of people. I think we have a pulse on where the people are far more than <clears throat> the executive, far more than military or intelligence officials, and I would say far more than the Senate. And so I think we have a pulse of the people, and in that regard then, when we talk about 702 and the fear and concern they have with Director Ray, if I could, I'm gonna read you a, a, a communication I had from a constituent who is a national security uh, expert, official, and then I'd ask you to respond, or maybe, maybe you don't want to, but it, I, I read this to you to illustrate, this is the challenge we have when it comes to reauthorizing. And much of this is shared by members of Congress as well, but quoting from him, we could show dozens of examples. Sending FBI agents to shut down local prosecutors for going after Jeff Epstein, systemic abuse of FISA, systemic abuse of First Amendment rights, targeting parents and Catholics, refusing to investigate multiple reports of sexual abuse of US gymnasts. The problem is, speaking of the FBI, they have no accountability, near absolute power, and they know no one, not even Congress, can touch them. That is what many, many Americans feel. 
And now we have to go to them and say, yeah, we understand your concerns, but at the same time, we want to reauthorize these powers and authorities. I, I read that for you as we discussed earlier. It's a challenge we have. You're, you're welcome to respond to it, although please do so briefly. Or if you just recognize, yeah, we, we need to admit to the American people that we've made mistakes and we're going to correct it. So, uh, Congressman, I appreciate you sharing your constituent's letter with me. Uh, what I would say is, uh, of course, like any major institution, we have made mistakes. Uh, some of the descriptions in the constituent's letter are not are not accurate in terms of what actually happened, but absolutely we have made mistakes. And to me, the mark of a leading organization is not whether it makes mistakes or not, all major organizations, all elite organizations do, but whether or not we learn from those mistakes. And I think we have, we've made all sorts of changes, which I could could go into on different issues, but but we're determined to be worthy of, of all Americans' trust, including your constituents. Well, and, and I appreciate that, because that's where we're going to find success, is if we can say that we recognize that we can do better. And, the, and to do better, the process has got to be reformed somewhat. And we look forward to working with you, because we do have to reauthorize 702. Director Haynes, this is to you. I think you're probably most appropriate to answer this. Now, I mean, there's so many things we could talk about here. We look forward to the closed hearing, as I said. But we have to talk about China. I reflect back on my military experience. There were a number of incidents, uh, you know, a couple times when we had uh, American assets, uh, American uh, intelligence aircraft who were captured and had or uh, had a forced landing in China. The P3 incident with the J8 is an example. And during that time, we didn't really know what our policy would be, what we would, how the U.S. would respond. Uh, in the past, the president has said pretty clearly that we would respond with military action if. China were to invade Taiwan. And then shortly after that, the administration kind of walked back those comments, but it didn't occur just once. It occurred several times. Um, we have this policy of strategic ambiguity, which has served us well for the last 30 years. But I wonder if it's not time for us to declare another policy, a new policy, and that is we will defend Taiwan. It's pretty clear the president seems to think that. Um, and I think if we're going to deter Again, understanding the, the need for strategic ambiguity before, but times are different now. If we're going to deter, I think we have to be clear in saying, yes, we will defend Taiwan militarily if we have to. Director, am I wrong? Uh, and, and has there been a change in the, in the administration's policy re regarding ambiguity? Thank you, Congressman. I'm, uh, obviously not um, in a position to comment on policy, but I, I certainly, I think you're right in uh, recognizing the president's comments on this issue and that that has been a pretty uh, strong statement. Okay, so let me, in the 13 seconds I have, do, you, do we agree that there would be stronger deterrence if our adversaries knew what, that we would defend militarily if necessary? You mean sort of, in this particular case, I think it is clear to the Chinese what our position is based on the president's comments. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I only went 10 seconds over, Mr. Chairman, so I yield back. Very, very good. Mr. Christian Morthley. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Himes, for unearthing evidence of free snacks at the NSA. Uh, we'll be visiting shortly, um, General Nakasone. Um, my first question is directed to uh, Director Ray. Uh, Mr. Ray, you've said that TikTok, uh, the uh, popular app on people's phones, is, quote, a tool that is ultimately within the, within the control of the Chinese government, and it screams out with national security concerns, close quote. Uh, we found that TikTok and ByteDance employees regularly engage in a practice called heating, close, in quotes, heating, a manual push that ensures specific videos quote, achieve a certain number of video views. Mr. Ray, can you rule out that TikTok has heated content at the direction of the CCP? I don't think we could rule that out. Can you, um, now let me just talk about another instance uh, of uh, what I think is very problematic behavior at TikTok and ByteDance, their parent company. In December of last year, ByteDance confirmed it used TikTok to monitor US journalists' physical location using their IP addresses in an attempt to identify whether they had been located by ByteDance employees. Can you rule out that this data was also shared with the CCP? I don't think we could rule that out. 
Could the CCP use TikTok uh, to shape political opinion, such as to inform the Amer misinform the American public? That what you just described there is one of the concerns that we have, namely that the control of the recommendation algorithm could be used to conduct influence operations. And much along the lines of your first two questions, it's important to understand that that's not something that would be easily detected or ruled out, as you say. Uh, and that's just one of the several uh, security concerns that we have about TikTok. Thank you. Uh, Director Haynes, recently my staff described to me a term called Guangzi. Apparently, Guangzi is a Chinese term uh, that refers to a part of Chinese culture where uh, people develop personal trust and a strong relationship uh, that can involve moral obligations and exchange of favors. And they suggested in the press, there's been suggestions that Guangzi has developed between Chairman Xi and Vladimir Putin. Let me ask you this question. Um, do we have any evidence that in Chairman Xi's calculations of potentially providing military assistance to uh, Russia in Ukraine, that he has ever discussed, or he has discussed among his uh, internal uh, cadres, potential assistance by Russia to China and the PRC in a potential invasion of Taiwan? Thank you, Congressman. I think maybe we could uh, discuss this in closed session. Okay, very good. Um, General Barrier, uh, I want to talk to you about something called peace disease, which has uh, uh, Chairman Xi has talked about repeatedly in his speeches recently. This is what a former general of the Central Military Commission in the PRC has described as peace disease. He said, quote, today the PLA hasn't been in actual combat for many years, yet the fires of war are burning throughout the world. In this area, the gap between the PLA and foreign militaries is growing day by day. And then he closes with the quote, this is an actual problem, close quote. This was a quote from two, a 2009 speech by the uh, general uh, of the Shenyang military region. This term, peace disease, uh, refers to supposedly a lack of combat readiness on the part of the PLA, has appeared 565 times in the PLA daily between 2012 and mid-2018, and just recently Xi Jinping said he wants to cure the peace disease. How do you assess when Chairman Xi would know that the peacetime disease has been cured and that their troops are ready for combat? I'm not sure that we could actually put a, a, a fixed date on that. We know there are a few dates out there, like 2027, 2035, and 2049. And, and we know that his, his leaders don't have the kind of combat experience uh, that say the the American uh, military uh, leaders have. So we, we think that this is in his mind and perhaps shapes the way that he thinks about about the readiness of his force. And we could probably go into a few more details on that in a closed session. Very good. Uh, Director Burns, I wanted to ask you a question about threats from ChatGPT, but I just couldn't think of any. So I went to ChatGPT and I said, ask question of CIA Director Burns about threats from ChatGPT. It said, Director Burns, what measures is the CIA taking to monitor and mitigate potential risks associated with the use of AI language models like ChatGPT? And how would you uh, prevent uh, AI language models uh, not to be used by malicious actors to spread false information or influence public opinion? That's from my pal, ChatGPT. Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to give you an example which um, I'm sure ChatGPT is very well aware of, and that is that you know, if you assume, say, a foreign in, an adversarial intelligence service where English is not the first language, and they're thinking about ways in which they could come up with compelling spear phishing messages, it's logical to use artificial intelligence of one, one kind or another to produce a message that can be pretty effective in spear phishing and therefore in taking advantage of vulnerabilities. Um, and so what we're working on with colleagues across the intelligence community are ways of identifying, you know, when that kind of spear phishing effort is being made using artificial intelligence by a foreign adversary. Thank you. Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I've got a Wall Street Journal uh, report I want to I refer to here. It was published earlier this week detailing how unprepared, in their view, 
America is for an era of, quote, great power conflict with the likes of China and Russia. Here are, here's a little bit of their analysis here. Quote, decades of ever bigger military budgets, including a 7% boost in spending this year, have improved the lethality of China's Air Force, missiles and submarines, and better trained. A better training has created a more modern force from what was once a military of rural recruits. China is developing weapons and other capabilities to destroy an opponent's satellites, the Pentagon says, and its cyber hacking presents a threat to infrastructure. Further, uh, a similar report from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute published findings around countries who are leaders in advanced technologies. 44 categories measured of those 44 <laughs> categories, the United States led in seven China led in the balance. I have that graph. I ask you now consent to enter into the record. Objection. Uh, China's research, the, the, the study said, quote, China's research strengths at the intersection of photonic sensors, quantum communication, advanced optical communications, in addition to post-quantum cryptography, cryptography could mean that intelligence communities, particularly the five eyes, could lose important capabilities and suffer from diminished situational awareness. China leads globally in photonic sensors, quantum communi communications, advanced optical communications, and post-quantum crypt cryptography. It further states, taken together, these observations increase the risk of Chinese communications going dark to the efforts of Western intelligence services. This reduces the capacity to plan for contingencies in the event of hostilities and tensions, end quote. Let me ask you, Panel, do you agree or disagree with those statements? And what is your agency or agencies, what are you doing to build, catch up, or stay ahead of China considering those comments? Congressman, if I might begin, uh, I would agree that China has shrunk the gap in terms of where they were previously to where they are today. What is the National Security Agency doing? Uh, several things. First of all, we play to our competitive advantages. We make code and break code better than anyone in the world. The second piece is that we look at partnerships. You mentioned the Five Eyes, but it's a broader set of partners that we have to bring in, academic partners, engage with industry, engage with allies. This is what gives us strength that China will never have. And the last piece is the close association that we have as a combat support agency with the Department of Defense to identify vulnerabilities, mitigate them, and then ensure that we can advance from them. Congressman, the Defense Intelligence Agency has recently reorganized with a China mission group that is specifically focused uh, on this threat. Um, we're continuing to engage our Five Eyes partners and other partners uh, in the region on where we can where we can work together to uh, to get after this threat um, in, a, in a collective way. And, and we will be expanding our footprint into the Indo-Pacific here very very soon. Excellent, thank you. Any further comments? Sure, sure. Just uh, I mean, we've done made the same kind of uh, important organizational changes because I think the. Two challenges that you just talked about, Congressman, are gonna be central to our futures in intelligence service, meaning China and competition with the PRC, and then the revolution in technology, which is gonna be the main arena for that competition. So what we've done is stepped up considerably our efforts to collect on all the areas that you described, stepped up our efforts working with partners in the US government, but also foreign partners as well, to slow down PRC's efforts to try to you know, gain an advantage in those areas. And then just to underscore what General Nakasone said, what's crucial to all this is working with partners, both in the private sector as well as foreign partners as well. Excellent. Let me flag one more issue for your attention. Uh, this is also a um, Wall Street Journal report. A remote corner of Taiwan confronts wartime scenario. That's the headline, Life with No Internet. And the, and the gist of this is there's, a, there's an island um, um, that had their internet cut off effectively. And, and, and this is typically a precursor uh, for um, kinetic action. And the question I have is, with regard to Taiwan, do you think we have adequate redundancies to be able to address that threat should that situation arise? I think I'll just say generally, this is an issue that we're worrying about across uh, all of partners, allies, et cetera, is to ensure that we have a way to help them. And I think we can um, yeah, further discuss details. So that's been the case in Ukraine where obviously that was exactly uh, diminished their capability for communications and so on, operational control. And that's why I asked the, the, the question because I obviously have some concerns about addressing that. Do we have the adequate resources in place to, to mitigate that threat? Um, thank you. I yield back. Mr. Crow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Russia has committed and continues to commit uh, unspeakable war crimes against the Ukrainian people during the conduct of this war. Uh, the United States is not a signatory to the International Criminal Court, uh, but Congress last year passed a law uh, that made it very clear 
that uh, we should provide uh, in, uh, intelligence and information related to these crimes to the International Criminal Court. And, and I'll quote, in the appropriations bill that passed late last year, uh, it allows an exceptions allowing for assistance with, quote, investigations and prosecutions of foreign nationals related to the situation in Ukraine, including to support victims and witnesses, end quote. And of course, uh, the discussion around that and the debate around that made it very clear that congressional intent was for the IC to provide that information to the ICC. It's my understanding that there's debate within the administration, uh, more specifically that the Department of Defense is preventing that assistance and that information from being relayed to the ICC, uh, including a principals meeting that occurred on February 3rd, uh, where there was debate about that. So, Director Haynes, it is, your, is it your understanding that current law passed by Congress uh, mandates the ICC provide, or the United States, the IC provide uh, this information to the ICC uh, in furtherance of uh, investigations of Russian war crimes. Thank you, Congressman. I, so um, we absolutely, and I, I don't think there's any debate that we should be providing support to the ICC on Russian war crimes, um, you know, as a general matter. The, uh, what, what we do is we provide a, intelligence that can be provided to the ICC through the arms of the US government that typically work with the ICC. So the State Department's War Crimes Issues Office, we don't do that directly. And uh, and I think, um, you know, it's really a question for them as to what exactly they're providing and whether or not- So is it your understanding, uh, Director, that uh, there is information that is currently not being provided to the ICC that uh, the intelligence community would like or otherwise would provide to the ICC that the, the Department of Defense and this administration is not allowed to be provided? No. So there, there's no dispute about that within the administration? I do, we provide it to the policy arms. They provide it to the ICC. I don't actually know exactly what they have provided. So more specifically then, is it your understanding that the Department of Defense is holding up the provision of information or intelligence to the ICC? No. It's not, that's not your understanding? It's not my understanding. Okay. I think Director Burns, do you, do you have an understanding one way or the other on this? No, the same as Director Haynes on that on the question you asked, sir. Okay. Uh, the next question is about uh, the the assistance generally to Ukraine. There's a lot of debate within Congress right now and, and with the administration about the both the, the quantity and the quality of the military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, my understanding is that Russia does not have the capability of any major offensives or breakthroughs currently in Ukraine, that they've been degraded sufficiently. So Director Burns, is that your understanding that in 2023 that the Russians couldn't conduct major offenses or have major strategic success in Ukraine? Yes, sir, it's our judgment that the uh, Russian military is capable of making incremental tactical gains and they made some in the course of the offensive they've launched over the last four or five weeks in the Donbas in Eastern Ukraine. But it is our collective assessment, I think, that for a whole variety of reasons that Director Haynes mentioned, munition shortages, morale problems, manpower problems, conflicts within their own military leadership, that they're unlikely to be able to make significant strategic breakthroughs or sustain them over the course of the rest of this year. And is it your understanding that uh, Vladimir Putin's strategy is to recapitalize the military, to consolidate support, uh, and to rebuild his infrastructure so that he will be capable of making uh, advances or strategic success within 2024 and 2025, that he's taking a longer-term view? Uh, yeah, I think Vladimir Putin is very much taking a longer-term view. I think he's doubling down in, in many respects right now. I believe he's convinced that he can make time work for him, that he can grind down the Ukrainians uh, through this war of attrition, that he can wear down Western supporters of Ukraine. And he's convinced also, uh, and has been for some time, the Ukraine matters more to him than to us. Therefore, the challenge, I think, is to puncture that view. So given that, uh, that decisions have to be made about relative risks and where risks lie, short-term risks versus long-term risks, would it be your best advice that we transition the nature of our support to look to more towards hardening Ukraine and military modernization efforts that would uh, look further out on the horizon than the shorter-term efforts? Well, I, I, you know, I avoid offering free policy advice in my current role these days. What I would say as a matter of intelligence assessment is that the next several months, the next four, five, six months, are going to be crucial on the battlefield in Ukraine. I think any prospect for a serious negotiation, which President Putin I do not believe is ready for today, is going to depend on progress on the battlefield. Therefore, I think analytically, 
What's important is to provide all the support that we possibly can, which is exactly what the President and our Western allies are doing for the Ukrainians as they prepare for a significant offensive in the spring. And then at the same time, it's not really an either or question, just as you said, Congressman, it's looking at the long-term security needs of Ukraine to help ensure a situation where Vladimir Putin's Russia is not gonna try uh, to mount another offensive or another invasion as they did at the beginning of last year. Thank you, I yield back. Ms. Stefanik. Director Ray, one year ago at this very same hearing, I asked you about the deadliest vehicle crash in decades in my district in upstate New York, the 2018 Schoharie limo crash, instantly killing 20 people. Those families have never been the same, and my office has communicated with many of them. The owner of the illegally retrofitted limo was a longtime FBI informant with a rap sheet a mile long, and it was because of my question to you in this open hearing that the FBI was forced to open an internal review. Let me be clear, that review was in response to our congressional oversight. Since then, that was a year ago, the FBI has stonewalled and slow walked our additional requests for updates on that review until, miraculously, just this week before you knew you were going to appear here today, we received an email informing this committee and myself of the following. The internal review is now complete. The FBI will provide a briefing, and in connection with that briefing, we will make available the internal review with certain redactions. We'll coordinate with your staff regarding the in-camera review of the materials. The FBI is providing this briefing and materials with the understanding that the committee will not publicly disclose the non-public information contained therein. Um, my expectation is that briefing will be this month. Do I have your commitment? Yes. Uh, I want to follow up. Can you commit to providing that briefing to those family members, immediate family members, the parents or spouses of those victims? On that one, let me make sure I talk with our folks and circle back with you about what can be shared if there are any limitations. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure that the victims and their families are appropriately informed, but I don't know yet what constraints there may be, so we will follow back up with you on yeah, that. Yeah, they have not been appropriately informed, and it's only because of my work in congressional oversight that they're starting to have sunlight. I believe you're a parent, Chris Ray? Yes, I'm a parent. I'm a new parent as well, and these, there is a set of parents that lost three daughters in that crash, so providing sunlight and transparency is important. I also want to note an important portion of the letter that was included. It says, the FBI considers the provision of the internal review as fulfillment of the above reference fence. I remind you that this committee, not the FBI, determines the level of transparency equating to full compliance with our constitutionally directed oversight role. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit this unclassified version of the letter for the record. It's ordered. Uh, I also want to shift gears here regarding Judiciary Committee. I serve on the select subcommittee there, and this committee has made 50 different requests for information and documents concerning the operations and the actions of the FBI. And to date, the FBI has not complied with the Judiciary Committee's long outstanding requests for information and documents. The FBI is accountable to Congress and by extension the American people. Responding to this routine oversight is the bare minimum. And today, the FBI failed to send a witness to the Judiciary Committee hearing, saying that we had this hearing happening. Can you commit to sending a witness before the next Judiciary Committee subcommittee hearing on March 28th? We're happy to work with you on making sure we Can make information available. Can you commit to provide a witness? We will, of course, make people available to the committee. But you didn't make people available today. This well, is the base minimum. The agencies need to provide witnesses. Can I get a commitment? Yes, you will provide a witness. We will work with you to make people available. That's not a yes. So for the American people, you are having the FBI director refuse to provide a witness. Just say I'm yes. Not, I'm not refusing to provide a witness. I want to be clear on that. I said we will work with you to make somebody available. So great. So someone will be made available. Yes. Yes, thank you. That's all I wanted, a yes. Moving forward. Do you believe the Hunter Biden laptop story is disinformation? Well, I want to be careful about it. There is an ongoing investigation that is relevant to that, uh, so I have to be careful of what I can share on that here. Do you believe the Hunter Biden laptop story is disinformation? I don't think there's anything I can share on that in open setting. Were you aware that the FBI personnel were in contact with Twitter regarding the Hunter Biden laptop story? I don't believe FBI personnel were in contact with, with Twitter about the Hunter laptop story specifically. I think there were people in contact with Twitter about Russian disinformation efforts. Of which the Hunter Biden laptop story was included according to the FBI. 
Well, I think I don't know exactly what you're looking at, but but I could be happy to talk about what it is the FBI does and does not do with respect to social media companies. Were you aware that the FBI had Hunter Biden's laptop since December of 2019? I can't speak to exactly when we had a laptop available. There is, a, there is as, you, as you know, there is an ongoing investigation run by the U.S. Attorney out of Delaware from the prior administration that we continue to work very closely with. And, and we have Baltimore, an ongoing investigation as well. And our Baltimore field office is working very hard with that U.S. Attorney, and I expect them to pursue that case uh, as far as it takes. This stonewalling, Director Ray. The American people deserve answers, and this is unacceptable. Lastly, did you sign off on the Mar-a-Lago raid? Uh, well, first off, it was not a raid. It was an execution of a search warrant. Did you second, sign off on the execution second, of the search warrant? If, may I finish? Second, I don't sign off on individual search warrants in that case or in any other. Did Attorney General Merrick Garland sign off to your awareness? I can't speak to the Attorney General. Was there dissent at senior levels of the FBI about the conducting of the, of the search warrant? I, I can't speak to internal discussions among the FBI or among the FBI and the Department of Justice. Even though it's been reported in the Washington Post? There are lots Multiple. of things reported in the media. I know, leaked from your agency. Yeah. Leaked from your agency yeah. frequently it's reported in the and Washington Post. It may or may Post. not be accurate. It may or may not be accurate. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Dr. Barrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, in preparation of this briefing, staff gave me a number of questions to, to ask, and then lo and behold, yesterday we got an email from the speaker and Leader Jeffries talking about a data breach at DC HealthLink that affects all, so we all got that. So let's talk about cybercrime, ransomware, et cetera. We have to, I, I'm sure we will get briefed um, on the data link in the future, but obviously cybercrime and ransom um, where is a major issue that we're dealing with and probably becoming much more frequent. Maybe this is a question for Director Haynes or D Director Ray. Um, I was prepared to ask about state actors, but also non-state actors. Um, we can harden all of our devices, harden all of our offices, but there are lots of weak links out there. And you know, I, I think a couple things. How do we work with the private sector to compel them to put in the resources to, to harden um, their cyber hygiene. Number two, how do, you know, and maybe this is for Director Ray or either one of you, um, for private sector companies, small and large ones, how do we compel them to make sure they're working with us, whether it's the IC or, or the broader community, to, to let us know when the ransomware uh, occurs? And because, you know, for us to address this issue, we have to be aware of the issue and we have to, you know, get that information. So, you know, to, to whoever's appropriate. Uh, so uh, you're, you're exactly right in one sense in particular that the private sector is the key to all of this. 85% of our critical infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector. It's probably a higher percentage of that when you look at our innovation and an even higher percentage than that when you look at our PII. Um, as you know, Congress passed, uh, which I think is an important first step, uh, a breach notification uh, uh, bill that will reach critical infrastructure in particular. I think there are things that can be done and should be done to strengthen that, to ensure that the information uh, not only is flowing from a broader swath of the private sector, but also is flowing uh, more quickly to us so that we can, so that we can help as quickly as possible. Uh, and then I think overall part of it is, is raising cybersecurity awareness which is part of what the uh, really active engagement that we're trying to participate in, all of us, with the private sector uh, is designed to accomplish. If I might add, Congressman, it also means being able to leverage what we do as an intelligence community, operating outside the United States, understanding what adversaries are doing, being able to see their tradecraft, being able to share that tradecraft publicly. This is back to the partnership that is very close between NSA and FBI in terms of when we see certain things happening there, being able to provide that to the FBI as they talk to uh, U.S. critical infrastructure companies in the United States. And we prioritize that work. That's very, very critical to us. Great. Thank you. Let me shift directions. Um, a couple weeks ago, I had a chance to go on a bipartisan codel to Japan in my foreign affairs capacity. And clearly, Japan is a geopolitical strategic ally in, of increasing importance. And you know, we applaud the Kushida administration for, for really stepping up and understanding the, the, the new framework. Yeah, they brought up um, 
in our meetings. You know, obviously, they're not at five eyes, but five eyes plus one, et cetera. But as we start to talk about their cyber hygiene, you know, the fact that you know, some of their own laws don't allow them to do security clearances, et cetera, we want to have this relationship. We want to uh, co-develop products. And you know, um, what can we do as Congress and then you know, um, working with the administration to the, they're very aware of their vulnerabilities on, on cyber, but it seems like it's moving very slow, and I'd be curious. So, Congressman, I'd welcome to brief you and other members of the committee of what we're doing with Japan and other partners in the Pacific to, as you indicate, raise the bar for cybersecurity. I think this is instrumental to understanding where uh, we need to go as both the intelligence community and select partners. We need to be able to share information uh, with the great assurance that they can protect it. We need to be able to communicate them with the idea that what we're saying will not be monitored. These are all things, and I, I give the Japanese great credit. Over the past several years, they have done tremendous work. Uh, but we do need to uh, focus on this very, very hard going forward. Right. Director Haynes, or anyone? Yeah, I'll just add to what General Nakasone said. I mean, this is an area of uh, work that we have been engaged with Japan, with the Republic of Korea. We have actually have a trilat through which we work together on these kinds of issues. It's incredibly important, as you say, just to build help all of us be better at cybersecurity, but then also to be able to work against, for example, North Korea, others that are engaging in activities that are attacking our systems. And all, all I would add, Congressman, is that you know we share uh, both the admiration for what Prime Minister Kishida and the Japanese leadership is doing now in terms of their national security, which is hugely important to our shared interests. Um, and I think we also applaud the Japanese leadership for understanding you know, what we've sometimes learned the hard way in the United States, it's not as if, you know, we have a monopoly on wisdom on this, but the importance of improving cybersecurity as well. And as an agency, we're working with our partners. I was last in Tokyo in December, I guess, talking about these issues to do as much as we can to be supportive as the committed allies that we are. Right. Thank you. Now you go back. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here, and I want to start off. The men and women who do the work of the IC are amazing men and women, and they protect this nation on a, on a daily basis. However, I will comment on some of the things that have happened. There's an erosion of trust in the American public uh, that you are protecting us and protecting all of our constitutional and civil rights that are created through the Constitution, whether that is leaks at high levels to the to, to media sources or to put a political viewpoint, which is not necessarily anybody at this table, whether that is uh, resistance to oversight and using is currently under investigation. Just understanding we are not a normal congressperson. We are selected for this committee. We have had trust in place by us, by both sides of the aisle, to be able to keep and maintain the same secrets that you do. There, uh, whether it's uh, not providing witnesses when we ask for them and saying, well, they may not want to be disclosed, we have subpoena power. If they don't want to disclose, we can subpoena them. It is important for us to be able to do our job as partners with you in that oversight. And that is what we want to do, not to throw daggers and rocks at you, but what we want to do is we are the people who are most charged with selling FISA renewal to the Congress and to the American people. And without proper oversight, we can't do that. As we used to say in the Army, one oh crap does away with 10 years of attaboys, okay? I mean, we cannot do that. So when one leak happens, if the public doesn't feel like we're addressing that appropriately, we have to do that. So I would just ask you, Director Haynes, what are we doing for you to help us rebuild the trust in the public that they have lost over years through, uh, many times it was pri it predates you, but it doesn't matter when it happened. We've got to turn the perception back that we trust the FBI, we trust the CIA, we trust the NSA. Absolutely, thank you, Congressman. I, I, I think having the trust of the American people from um, with respect to the intelligence community is absolutely fundamental, and it's it's critical to us doing our job for all of the reasons that you indicated, but also so that when we put out a warning frankly, that the American people trust it enough to act on it or to be, uh, you know, subject to it. And I'm, so what we're doing is, across the board, trying to ensure that we have appropriate oversight over the extraordinary powers that we have. In the context of 702, I think you've heard a little bit from Director Ray, but, uh, but honestly, all of us have a lot to say on this subject. 
really the investment that we're making in training and policies and procedures that help to ensure that we are doing things in accordance with the law, that we are looking at designs of technology to ensure that it is actually quite hard to do anything else. We are looking at the oversight process every you know two months. Let, let me, because I want to get a, a little Please. more. I mean, I used the raids recently, uh, in, in raids, search warrants, whatever, all the documents. Uh, through multiple presidents and vice presidents that were improperly disclosed. We've got to do a better job of not telling the American public all those things, but they have to know when the, when the SIPSI asks for those things and when we ask for those things and you tell us we don't have a need to know or a right to know, I can assure you that erodes public trust. That does not help. We are not partisan folks on this committee when we are asking that. We are asking that for oversight, so I just ask that you comply with those. And the second thing, I'm gonna shift a little bit to the Southern Hemisphere, because I know in your Senate here, and you talk quite a lot about the border and those kind of things. We also talked about uh, transnational terrorist organization and drug cartels and those things. That is not a kinetic fight. But I just ask you guys to look at what we as an intelligence community and a Title X community, what, what can we do training assist wise to move to the southern border of Mexico south, what can we do to improve our standing in those nations through training and assist or through intelligence provided to them? What can we do to strengthen our relationship so we don't have so much pressure on our border? I'll, I'll start and I'm sure others will wanna weigh in. I mean, one thing that I would call out, you, you rightly said Mexico and then further south. Uh, so one of the things that we've been doing that I think we can double down on, and we're trying to do that, is work with the Northern Triangle countries, you know, where you've got MS-13, 18th Street Gang, et cetera. But to illustrate how thorny and complicated this problem is, we have what we call transnational anti-gang task forces in all three of El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala. And in El Salvador recently, for example, working with them, we had a massive MS-13 takedown which was great. On the one hand, you got all these people locked up in El Salvador before they got anywhere near the border. The problem is there's so many of them that the ones that didn't get caught immediately started fleeing, looking for someplace else to go, and guess where they wanted to come? They're heading straight for our border. So it illustrates why we can't just kind of play whack-a-mole. We have to try to have a comprehensive solution to this problem. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Great. I'm going to ask you now, Mr. Consent that we go to four minutes, not three, we would, uh, but four in order for us to be able to get done to make it to our one o'clock. Ms. Spainberger. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to everyone who's here. I proudly serve so many members of the intelligence community as their representative in Congress. And so on that note, I'd like to start with something that has impacted personnel. I'd like to begin we reset by, the clock, please? by saying that I appreciate uh, the outreach that I have received from various agencies, knowing of my interest in this. Um, and, and the conversation hopefully will con, uh, continue in closed session, but in this unclassified document, I'd like to just ask for comments on the fact that it literally says what to me are somewhat contradictory statements in one paragraph, noting it is unlikely that a foreign actor, including Russia, is conducting a sustained worldwide campaign involving hundreds of incidents, it continues, related to anomalous health incidents, Further in the paragraph, it says the IC continues to actively investigate the AHI issue, focusing particularly on a subset of priority cases for which it has not ruled out any cause, including the possibility that one or more foreign actors were involved. Uh, there's a lot of consternation among those who have been impacted by AHI. I appreciate the work that you all are doing in making sure people are having their health needs met. But would anyone like to comment on what appears to be by my reading, somewhat contradictory statements in one small paragraph. Okay, I'll start. No, thank you very much, Congresswoman. I, I think there is no question, while as your, the analysis that you're looking at indicates that, uh, that as a general matter, you know, um, across the IC, most IC elements now have concluded that it is very unlikely that a foreign adversary is responsible for the reported AHIs. And there are different degrees of confidence associated with that. And then you have some that look at it as unlikely that a foreign adversary essentially have done this part. At the same time, and this is sort of where you know our work continues, and there's no question that, uh, that we see this as a continued priority for us, is that we are 
going to be and continue to be vigilant about looking for information that undercuts those assumptions because we recognize there are gaps here. We are gonna to continue to focus on trying to understand essentially what it is that we can do to help the folks that have experienced these very real symptoms and these issues um, and to figure out what's happening to each of them. And as we look at uh, the experts panel that went through process to look at different mechanisms that might in fact be causing different symptoms, issues, and so on, they had recommendations on research and development that would continue to go forward, and that is something that we are also pursuing. And any remaining questions that we have are things that we are looking to try to ensure that we're focused on being forward. So we, just, like, we're yeah. currently at a point, is it correct to say, where this is a point in time analysis and the door is very much open and the investigation very much continues that there could be a reversal or not of new information that would cause a new assessment that might differ from what we've seen thus far? Yeah, I guess what I would say, Congressman, and first I have huge respect for your service um, at the agency as well and to the intelligence community, and I'd say several things. Um, yeah, none of us are pretending that I think the um, thorough and rigorous work that was done reflected in the intelligence community assessment um, is um, none of us are pretending that that's absolutely the final word in this. We will, we will sustain a dedicated unit of officers at CIA working with our partners in the intelligence community, not just to be alert to any new leads that could develop, but to follow them rigorously. We will also continue to focus with our partners on research and development efforts by our adversaries that could focus on directed energy mechanisms as well. The only things I would add is first, from the day I began as director of CIA more than two years ago, I've understood, I've tried hard to understand the significance of this issue. It's not an abstraction. It's about real people suffering, you know, real health conditions and real pain in the service of their country. Um, and so we've made fundamental improvements in the level and access to care. They will not diminish. Uh, we remain committed to, you know, supporting all of our workforce as well, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. If I may pivot quickly, because I will want to continue the conversation related to this in closed session, um, related to fentanyl trafficking, which is impacting communities across the country, but uh, certainly in, within Virginia, uh, can you update the committee on your efforts to combat uh, cartels and the trafficking of fentanyl uh, that we have seen to be so lethal within the United States? I'd be glad to start, Congressman, and, and Congressman, and I'll bring this back to the 702 issue, too, because it has been a crucial tool in our efforts at CIA to collect foreign intelligence and enable our partners, whether it's in Mexico or in our domestic partners in the United States, to take action to help protect Americans against the fentanyl crisis. So I'll give you a couple of broad examples, anyway. One is, we've, we've first I should say, we've transformed our approach at the agency to how we look at this issue to focus on networks, meaning precursor chemicals, financial flows, you know, the- Precursors coming in from China, from where China else going and to South America. And, and then also fentanyl, you know, production and processing equipment as well. 702 has been crucial in illuminating that network for us and therefore enabling us, for example, just in the last few months, to work with Mexican partners to take some very successful actions against the Sinaloa cartel. Um, and then also in another instance, enable us to work with other partners um, to take significant action against fentanyl production and processing equipment in Mexico and in the United Degrading States. Degrading equipment and those networks? Yes. Thank you for that update. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Fitzpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here and uh, for your service to our nation. Um, I just want to ask one question uh, for the panel. Um, it's my personal belief that um, the biggest challenge facing uh, the intelligence community and therefore the biggest potential threat facing our nation um, is when, um, unlike 9-11, where we had universal 100% support, um, we had incredible bipartisanship here in Congress, incredible universal support for the intelligence agencies, when um, things happen, um, and by the way, in the case of, of um, uh, Director Haynes, Director Burns, uh, Director Ray, uh, due to the actions of your predecessors, not yourselves, you've been forced to deal with their actions. Um, when there's a chipping away of that uh, trust, um, there's, when we're impaneling juries and, and conducting jury questioning, there's a way to remove jurors for bias, um, amongst other things. The background check system, the polygraphs can screen for drug use, uh, foreign contacts and the like, but there's really no way that I'm aware of, and I don't know if there's a policy solution that we can check for bias. Because I think the biggest threat 
to these agencies is when there's a public perception that there's a political bias on the left or the right. Um, it could be both. It used to be easy to do that when we lived in different times, but our country is very, um, you know, hyperpartisanship is at a spike right now, and that invariably bleeds into the hiring process and makes it tough for um, uh, the agencies to screen for that. So how do you deal with that, right? I mean, w when I was in the Bureau, we rarely, if ever, heard any talk about politics. We really didn't, and I took that as a source of pride for the Bureau, uh, but this was before we've seen the spike in hyperpartisanship. Um, how, does the, how do your agencies combat that? Because it really is a risk because it bleeds into the public not having faith, in some cases justified, in some cases not, um, of the actions of the various agencies. Well, I, there, obviously it's a complicated topic. Uh, one thing I will point to that we've done, uh, because I think you're right to focus not just on actual problems which have occurred, uh, but, but appearances, issues, perceptions, those things matter. And so one of the things that we did uh, is I ordered a stand down uh, to focus on uh, not just objectivity, but making sure that we avoided even the appearance of bias. And so I started in a way that you will, from your past experience, recognize as very unusual at the FBI. Instead of saddling the front lines with some new training requirement because of something somebody else somewhere did, I started at the top, so I took all 250 or whatever it is of the SESers, all the way from Legat in Australia, all the way to California, and made them all come to Quantico for a single day where the overwhelming message was back to fundamentals, the right thing in the right way, what they heard from judges, because a lot of what you're describing about is sort of trying to adopt more of the kind of mindset the judges have. They may have political backgrounds, but they put those to the side. They check them at the door when they take on the robe. We need to have that same kind of mentality. So the point was to start at the top with everybody at the top of the organization, make them take the medicine first, and then push it out to the workforce, and we did it for the entire workforce. Can I just add to that? Just to say that um, I think this is a critical issue, and I think Congressman, you know, as you think about this, if you have ideas for us, please let us know. I, I see this as, first of all, from a leadership perspective, setting the tone for a culture that makes clear that just as you described your prior experience in government, that politics have no place in the workspace and in national security, that this is something that, you know, I, I also as, grew up as a civil servant in the government and nobody asked me what party I belong to, that was never an issue, and that's something that just has no place in our work. And, uh, and I think we are looking, you know, as Director Ray's comments made clear, like across the intelligence community, all of us, I think feel very strongly about setting that tone for culture and making sure that that's not an issue. I think the second piece for, for the IC more generally is in fact engaging in greater transparency where we can. And I think exposing our assessments, doing an annual threat assessment world hearing in an open forum as you've asked us to come back and do, trying to put out more of our products trying to give an opportunity for the American people to see the work that we do, sort of, you know, to give a little bit more insight into how it is that we do things um, can help. And then finally, in the context of transparency, giving more of a sense of the rules within which we operate and do not. And that's something that we're continuing to try to push out frameworks and ways of working and compliance things to expose when we make mistakes and when we don't and why it is that we're, what we're doing about it. Director, we're going to have to move on if you don't mind holding your comments. Great. Mr. Crenshaw. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And thank you all for being here. And um, look, I, I think you're all very serious so security professionals, intelligence professionals. Um, and I think that most of this report um, certainly reflects that. Uh, but there is a, a, a glaring exception to that. And specifically in the section on climate change and environmental degradation. Now, don't get me wrong, I think this is indeed an issue, but I address this issue on a very different committee, not here, and for very good reason. So I have a simple question. What creates greater geopolitical instability? It is, the, is it the occasional severe weather event, or is it energy insecurity? In other words, the inability of nations to secure reliable and affordable sources of energy. Which one creates more global chaos and therefore represents a national security threat to the United States? Is it one or the other or both? I suppose I'll direct that question, I'm sorry, but to you, Director Haynes, because you mentioned it earlier. No, thank you, sir. I, so 
One I or the see. other or both, because I, I, I have a lot to say on this. I, I don't I, have a way of quantifying it for you, so I'm happy to try to take that for the record if that's useful. Okay. Let's assume you, you, know, you try to say both or one or the other, but the report only says one. The report only says one. So, but if it was both, then why wouldn't energy scarcity be mentioned as a global threat? Why isn't radical environmentalism mentioned as a global threat? The last few years have some pretty glaring examples that I'm gonna point them out in my limited time here. In Sri Lanka, radical environmentalist policies led to the collapse of farming outputs and the collapse of a government. The same thing is currently happening in the Netherlands where their entire farming industry is under threat. In Pakistan, your report mentions some flooding, but says nothing of the hundreds of millions of people without power because of energy scarcity due to foolish green energy policies by the Europeans that have made natural gas so unaffordable in countries like Pakistan. European energy prices have gone through the roof and they now desperately import coal and wood to burn because they engaged in misguided green energy policies for years. The WHO estimates that three million deaths result per year from lack of clean cooking fuels, meaning they're burning wood or dung instead of fossil fuels like propane and natural gas. These things are truly destabilizing the global security, but there isn't a section in this report about it. The report does say that it's weather events that are a national security threat and that tensions will rise as developing nations request reparations from developed nations of course, the assumption is that all weather events are due to climate change. That's not science, by the way, it's an assumption, and I wouldn't expect ex assumptions from senior intelligence professionals. It's worth examining the actual science. Is, has anybody read the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, all 4,000 pages? Uh, really? Okay. <laughs> but let's assume you have. It's got some good data in it, actually. I like that report, and it would help this report be more objective. For instance, it actually makes science-based predictions about what the true economic cost of climate change will be over the next 100 years. It says the cost of climate change by the year 2100 will be a 4.5% reduction in global GDP from what it otherwise would be. Not from what it is now, from what it otherwise would be. So if we go on our trend of growth, we'd grow global GDP by 450%. The cost of climate change make that maybe 434%. That is not a national security threat, and I'm sure you all agree with that. The report also states that insured losses due to catastrophes and climate change have increased 250% in the past 30 years. That is a fact taken way out of context. It's misleading. And again, I wouldn't expect it from intelligence professionals because the obvious explanation is that there's more homes and more infrastructure built on coastal, uh, coastal areas. The truth is, the facts are, that the deaths from natural disasters have decreased 90% over the last 100 years. The truth is that the trend in accumulated cyclonic energy, a metric that captures frequency, duration, and intensity of global hurricane activity, shows no increasing in trends. In 2021, we had the fewest hurricanes since satellite tracking began 40 years ago. NOAA modeling shows that hurricanes making landfall will decrease 25% as the climate changes. The UN report, the science, the, the, never says red alert, never says crisis, never says any of the stuff commonly used by climate alarmists. I'm running out of time, so I just want to summarize if the chairman will let me. When we, when we say this kind of stuff and we, we, we detract from the very important topics that you all have been talking about this entire time, we detract from that. And it's even worse when we don't at least balance it with the more obvious threat of energy insecurity globally and the destabilizing effects that that creates. That's my problem with this report, and I hope we fix it next time, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the panel so much for being here in uh, this important open testimony for the American people to hear directly from you. Appreciate, uh, Mr. Ray, your candid responses to the questions. Director Haynes, you started out in your statement, and you were talking about uh, the slowing in uh, Chinese economic growth and you stated that uh, China now faced uh, some domestic economic challenges. Uh, so I'd like, what is your assessment of what those primary domestic economic challenges for the PRC are? What, how do you assess that uh, slowing that economic vulnerability in China? Thank you, Congressman. I, I just, I point to a few here. So one is, these are sort of structural issues that I think are going to be a challenge for China moving forward. Uh, one is their population, basically, their aging population. So they peaked in 2021, and last year they declined by 850,000 people. It's the largest decline in over 60 years, and with a relatively low fertility rate, um, China's population will continue to shrink even as it ages, and this is gonna reduce China's labor force and likely increase expenditures on age-related uh, health issues as they're going forward. I think a second piece of this that is sort of looking at 
um, the domestic migrant workers' wages in China, in low-skilled industries, have more than doubled on average, as the quantity of migrant labor from rural areas has actually declined. And this has contributed to several major domestic and foreign firms' decisions to actually to relocate their firms uh, from China to low wage, lower wage countries such as Vietnam or to you know issue expansion plans in China, leaving large numbers of China's low skilled workers unemployed. And then furthermore, China is going to need to improve education and training really to better prepare its workforce. And at least 100 million low skilled workers risk losing their jobs as a result of automation that they're pursuing. And vocational education to sort of upskilled, untrained rural labor faces really entrenched obstacles within China. So these are some of the issues that we're looking at that sort of make it a particularly challenging environment. And we think they're going to continue to sort of pursue their you know, statist economic policies so that state direction is a part of it, which will not be as efficient, essentially, in their movement forward. Well, in a follow-up to that, do you assess that in their last 15 years of extraordinary space and defense technology buildup, that that workforce is aging? In other words, it has a medium age higher than, you know, our baby boom generation, and therefore they uh, even have vulnerability in their defense space technological base because they have an aging workforce there? Or is that a younger than average workforce? What's your assessment there? I don't know the answer to that. I'll find out. Thank you. Um, uh, Director Burns, in, in, in open source information, there's a lot of uh, conversation about how effective the uh, crypto criminals in, in, uh, the, in DPRK in North Korea are about stealing cryptocurrency from wallets around the, around the world. And that's in turn, uh, many times their export earnings or what we know to be their export earnings, I think they, most of their earnings are, are stolen, so it's kind of hard to gauge what those might be. What is, what is the United States doing to interdict and uh, block and uh, stop the illicit flows to uh, North Korea through that mechanism? I appreciate very much the question, and maybe we can go into this in a little more detail in the closed session, but as we discussed when you came out to headquarters, this is a, a significant priority for us right now, and I know it's shared across the intelligence community because the North Korean regime does look at just what you described as a way of sustaining itself, of you know acquiring revenue as well. So there are a number of things that we can do working with some of our allies to counter that, but I Good. prefer to talk about oh, Thank that. you. You're back, Mr. Chairman. The list is currently Garcia, Waltz, Scott. Mr. Garcia. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses. This has actually been a very enlightening uh, and, and, frankly, clarifying couple of hours for me, uh, but I think in, in the most disappointing way. I've been personally baffled over the last two years about our southern border policies coming out of this administration, uh, where in the last uh, year we had 30 times the number of people die uh, as a result of fentanyl poisonings than, than folks died during the 9-11 event. Today, more people in our country will die of fentanyl poisoning uh, than Americans died overseas in one day of World War II operations. And what's enlightening to me is that we didn't spend almost any time on this topic today except for the questions that have been posed to you. I read the 39 pages of the, uh, the, the ATA uh, the 15 minutes of your testimony, Director Haynes, uh, and, and really no mention of these things. You talk about misperceptions of U.S. policies when we are actually being actively invaded on our southern border right now as a result of this administration's policy. So what's clarifying to me is the fact that we're sitting here with five people with billets, such as Director of National Intelligence, Director of Central Intelligence, Director of National Security Agent, Director of uh, Defense Intelligence Agency and the FBI, and you guys aren't messaging this as the number one threat. I look at your table of contents within the, when the, within the uh, threat, the annual threat assessment. You got China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, climate change, health security, uh, developments in technology, transnational organizations, global terrorism, uh, and, 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 and the like. And I, I agree with these topics, and I want to put a boot on the throat of Russia, China, North Korea, uh, and Iran just as much as anyone else. But this is, is, it's a shame that the fact that these poisonings right now that you characterize as overdoses and the migration challenges, as you say, Director Haynes, which are not migration challenges, this is an active invasion of our southern border, are being characterized by this body 
It's indicative to me that you are not briefing the President of the United States on these issues correctly and that you're not putting the proper emphasis on the fact that we are being invaded and Americans are dying at a higher rate than Americans died during World War II on a daily basis as a result of these policies. That's why these policies haven't changed. Very clarifying to me today based on your testimony as well as the ATA. Uh, on a separate subject, uh, Director Haynes, I want to ask you, uh, well, first of all, I want to ask you what you mean by uh, misperception of U.S. policies when it comes to our southern border, uh, and I'll let you address that as, as quickly as you can, please. Thank you, Congressman. I apologize if I gave you a misimpression that we do not believe that counter-narcotics is a critical aspect of our uh, work and that it is a priority for the intelligence it's not community. Counter -nar and not to interrupt, it's not counter-narcotics. It's security of our homeland, defense of our southern border. That is not the priority. You didn't give me their perception, you've given the American people that perception, and your annual threat assessment reflects that. And frankly, we'll look at your budgets. I'm an appropriator with them for the, the Justice Department. I'll look at your budgets to see if it reflects that priority here shortly, but, uh, but sorry, go ahead and continue. No, uh, I just want you to know that that is a priority from our perspective. I think uh, from uh, on the border, we actually, um, you know, obviously support and facilitate the United States government terrorism watch listing process. We have parts of our, um, even in ODNI and CTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, serves as the USG's central and shared knowledge. Uh, basically unknown and suspected terrorists, and we maintain TIED, and we do a lot of work to try to ensure that all of the intelligence we have is provided to our border uh, agents and uh, to the Department of Homeland Security for the work. I can reclaim the last 10 seconds. It's, it, it's a priority. I would submit that it needs to be your number one priority, and as a mission right now, we are failing. This is a war that we are currently losing, uh, and at the rate of 100,000 American lives every year. So I'll defer my technical questions for the classified setting, but thank you, guys. Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to build on Mr. Garcia's questions, Director Ray, if ISIS or Al Qaeda poison through chemical warfare 70 to 80,000 Americans, will we approach that as a law enforcement problem or a military national security problem? I think we would approach it as all of the above. So you would use, certainly we would use military assets, whether it's cyber, space, what have you. You, would, you have the authorization through the authorization use of military force to do so, correct? That's my understanding. You would also have the authorization to use military resources against the Sinaloa and Jalisco cartels if you had that authorization to use of military force, correct? I believe so, although now you're getting a little bit out of my area of expertise. But. Would you welcome additional, for example, offensive cyber from Cybercom? Would you welcome those additional resources? We know how to deconstruct cartels, terrorist organizations. We did it in the 90s in Colombia uh, without a single American combat troop on the ground, and we can do it again now. Would you welcome those additional resources? Well, you'll never find an FBI director that won't welcome more Fair tools enough. in the fight. All right, just switching, uh, that, that's good to hear. Just switching tax. Uh, director Haynes, is ISIS and Al Qaeda's capability uh, increasing in Afghanistan right now in terms of their capability to attack the West, attack US interests overseas, influence attacks in the United States or even potentially attack the homeland? Are they increasing? So I wouldn't characterize them as increasing, I, although I would say um, certainly- They still have the intent. And yeah. yes, for ISIS-K in particular in Afghanistan, they still have the intent, but we can obviously go further you know, in closed session on details. Is our collection capability, have our collection capabilities since the summer of 2021 decreased in Afghanistan and in the surrounding region? Certainly with the removal of the U.S. troops and presence in Afghanistan, absolutely our you know collection day to day has decreased, although I think again we can talk we to you. still have the groups that have the intent to attack us. I would, I'm hearing. I, I think we can talk about what our collection posture is vis-a-vis -vis those groups in Afghanistan in closed session and I think uh, can give you some comfort on that issue. And I'm sorry, guys, and all I would add is, you know, of course it's true, you're right, our capabilities are not the same as when we had, you know, a lot of presence on the ground. Um, however, um, you know, as we've all promised you over the last couple of years, we work incredibly hard to try to ensure that we can still take action as the U.S. government did against Iman I'll, I'll look forward to uh, the closed session, however, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that managing sources by Zoom 
uh, or remotely without being on the ground is anywhere near uh, a, a, as effective. Um, General Barrier, would you, would the Chinese Communist Party, would Beijing take note if we had an air base a couple hundred miles from their western border? Yes, I believe they would. 12,000 foot runway that we could potentially stage strategic assets a few hundred miles from their massive nuclear buildup? Yes, I believe they would. Do you think, I know this is a bit speculative, do you think if the Chinese had a 12,000 foot runway a few hundred miles from the US border, they would give it up for free? No. They would protect that asset, right? But we gave up Bagram Air Base. We no longer have access to that air base. Is that correct? That is correct. And the British government's now in negotiations to potentially, we could potentially lose asset to Diego Garcia. Would that be significant? That would be significant. Um, finally, Director Ray, can you, um, you rightly uh, sounded the alarm bell of opening a counterintelligence investigation every 12 hours with the director of MI5. Uh, the National Science Foundation's had a 1,000% increase in referrals uh, for grant theft, fraud theft, research theft. Yet, can you just answer me, I'm out of time, uh, for the record on shutting down the China initiative or rebranding it, renaming it, and at least from many people's perspective, diminishing it in priority. Just get that from the record. Well, I, I, I can't speak to the De Justice Department's uh, uh, initiative itself. All I can tell you is that at the FBI, we're not taking our foot off the gas one iota on the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party, including in the. But if we're not prosecuting, if we're not prosecuting with the same fervor, then that's an issue. Well, I think we're going to try to use every tool in the toolbox that we have. That'll include criminal prosecutions when we can do that. That'll include other things when we can do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, uh, I'm from Georgia. You've been there the last several years. 20 years ago, if you looked at the list of groups that the SPLC would have said were hate groups, those groups would have been proud to have been named by them, and uh, I think most Americans would have agreed with the list that they put out. Uh, today, they put out lists with names like the American Family Association and the Alliance Defending Freedom, and yet one of their attorneys was just recently charged in Atlanta with domestic terrorism. It, it bothers me to see them cited as a source from your agency on who is and is not uh, considered uh, a domestic terrorist. Can, can you speak to the relationship between the FBI and, and the influence that the SBLC has? Is it just a list that you look at from time to time, or is there coordination? Well, well first off, uh, just to be clear, I, I've considered Georgia my home since, okay. since I first got married uh, you know, back in 1989. Um, so we have that in common. Uh, second, as to the, the product that you're referring to, the intelligence product, um, when I first saw it, and I said this yesterday, I was aghast. Uh, it was a okay. single piece of an intelligence product by one field office. Okay. Uh, it did not meet our standards, and okay. I, I had it immediately removed and withdrawn, and we've taken okay. steps to make sure it doesn't happen again. And one of the Thank reasons you. I say that, okay. one of the ways in which I say that is the okay. sourcing Thank your you. question. The sourcing didn't meet our standards. Thank you. Um, you represent an agency that for years I held in the highest regard. Uh, I will tell you I lost a lot of respect for the Justice Department and the FBI with what happened in a, in a certain case in Valdosta where there was uh, absolute evidence that a man and uh, two kids had absolutely nothing to do with the death of another individual. Uh, that man happened to be an FBI agent. And uh, while he, was, he and his family were all cleared by state, local, and the FBI said nothing happened here, there was indisputable evidence. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. carried out a civil rights investigation for over two and a half years. And while that family was getting death threats repeatedly because of that investigation continuing to stay open, the U.S. Attorney's Office refused to release the absolute evidence of where all three individuals were. Well, what can be done to ensure that the, that the U.S. Attorney's Office is held accountable when they take actions like that that put Americans at risk, especially in this case, it was an FBI agent and his family? Well, I, I confess I'm not familiar with the, the specific case. Uh, in, in general, speaking just in general, when there are 
disciplinary Sorry. violations by prosecutors. Okay. There's a something called OPR, the Office okay. of Professional Responsibility. I'm, I'm going to move on then. I, I, I'm going to I'm going to speak with you. We're going to get familiar with that case because I think I think that the agents would like for you to probably be familiar with that case. Uh, China flew a spy balloon across the United States. Um, in less than 15 days later, Ford Motor Company, one of America's most iconic brands, said they were going to team with CATL Technology uh, to develop a multi-billion dollar battery plant. Um, Director Haynes, is it time for us to declassify a lot of the information that we have on China, their espionage, and what they're doing to Americans in our industry so that we can uh, explain to corporate America that you, you have to uh, break your ties with communist China? Thank you, sir. We do actually and have been continuing to try to declassify as much information as we can on these issues so as to ensure that corporate America has everything that they need to protect themselves. The key to not going to war with China is for corporate America to understand they have to dual source or multi-source and get out of there. Um, with that, I yield the two seconds, and Director Ray, sorry I had to cut you off, but I'm on that clock. Mr. Gallagher. Thank you. I apologize for being late. Um, Director Ray, yesterday you expressed concern about the CCP's ability through its ownership of ByteDance to control narratives, software data on TikTok. Uh, so long as ByteDance or another Chinese entity owns or maintains control of TikTok or its algorithm, would you maintain those concerns? Yes, it's the ownership uh, of the CCP that, that fundamentally cuts across all those concerns. And specifically ownership of the algorithm, the control of the algorithm. Well, it's, it's control of the algorithm, it's access to the data, and it's the software's, uh, it's control of the software which allows access to the devices. So you've got a, a data collection issue uh, which could be used to conduct all kinds of data operations and traditional espionage. It's the algorithm, that, as you rightly pointed out, that is, enables them to conduct influence operations. And as I said in response to an earlier question, that's particularly concerning because it's not at all clear we'd be able to detect that. And then third and finally, uh, it's the control of the software, which gives them access to millions of devices. And all you got to do is look at the fact that the Chinese government has the biggest hacking program in the world, bigger than that of every other major nation combined, put that together with the fact that they have stolen more of Americans' personal and corporate data than every nation, big or small, combined. And you put that together with the risks that you and I are talking about, and to me, it highlights what a big concern this is. So I guess the question is, for all of you, I'll just go down simply, should we ban TikTok or force a sale to an American company? Well, I've expressed my concerns. I'm not sure how else the problem could be solved, but I, I've expressed my concerns, which are the ownership of the CCP. So is that a yes? Again, I don't speak to bans. It's not ultimately my, that's a policy decision that's kind of beyond my. You, you all have a voice in the CFIUS process. And, and we are absolutely, I know that we are, I think we all are expressing our assessments of the intelligence, the risks, the threats in the CFIUS process. But there's a, the ultimate decision about that is you know, beyond the scope. So in that process, you, yeah. you haven't been asked yes or no yet? Uh, well, again, we, we submit our intelligence to the other participants, yeah. and then there's a, uh, a committee that does its work. Director Burns, sorry to be obtuse. Should we ban or force a sale of TikTok to an American company? Well, all I'd say, Congressman, I absolutely share the concerns that Director Ray has mentioned, but you know, we're not in the business of you know making policy calls on bans or no bans. But I absolutely share the concerns, and we're not shy about expressing those concerns. So in the CFIUS process, you, you don't get asked for a recommendation one way or the other? I, well, speaking for the FBI, we, we're asked to submit our intelligence mm -hmm. assessment uh, but we're not asked for, uh, at least it's been my experience, we're not asked for a, 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 like a recommendation about what the ultimate decision should Director be. Director Haynes, we, same question. Yeah, no, we do not provide a recommendation. It, essentially, as Director Ray is indicating, what happens is our office pulls together the intelligence from the intelligence community that's relevant to any particular CFIUS transaction, and we provide that into the process, essentially, as, uh, you know, grounds for policy discussion. Do you share Director Ray's concerns? I do share the concerns. I share the concerns of foreign uh, entity uh, owned social media platforms, other things that can, you know, be misused effectively. And we have a, a national OPSEC program is what we call it. The National Counterintelligence and Security Center runs us and they have issued uh, guidance essentially on 
these types of, uh, the use of these kinds of, um, you know, applications and platforms. General Naksoni, do you share Director Ray's concerns? Are you willing to answer certainly, the question whether we Certainly, one third, of, uh, one third of Americans get their news from TikTok every single day. One sixth of American youth say they're constantly on TikTok. That's a, that's a loaded gun, Congressman. And as you know, we are executing for us uh, the work to uh, ensure that TikTok is not on government, uh, uh, government applications and, and, and IT. I'm out of time, but go for it. I, I would, I would just it. say we support the CFIUS process, and, and as we brief uh, decision makers on policymakers with the intelligence we have, our analysts are, are uh, in active and open dialogue. If their opinions are asked, they will give those, those opinions. I, I agree with everything that's been said here. And um, I have a deputy director who has three teenagers. If, uh, if TikTok goes, uh, she may not be able to go home. In closing, pursuant to 707 Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act 50 U.S.C. 1881A and FAB1, you all provide to us uh, annually a list of the, um, the um, characterization of potential abuses of FISA. Um, Director Ray, your um, answer to uh, Congressman LaHood was that uh, you have undertaken reforms internally and that you believe it would significantly reduce uh, the overall abuses that we are all concerned about in the FBI. Uh, anticipating that that might be your answer, we have a letter for you that we'll be presenting at the end of the hearing requesting that you go back and look at all of the reports that we have received that indicate those abuses and provide us, because it's going to be important to our working group, how those um, abuses that are identified uh, would have been addressed under your new reforms so that we could find out what's remaining. And uh, if there's no objection, I'll, I ask that this uh, letter be entered into the record. No objection. Uh, thank you all. Uh, you continue to show your professionalism and expertise in your answers, and we look forward to continuing to working with you. We'll be adjourned. Mm -hmm.